Welcome to the Iced Coffee Hour. My name is Layla Hormozzi, and over the last two years, this podcast has made over two million in uh, <laughs> revenue from AdSense. Really? I wish. Yeah, that's close. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? What's the number, Graham? Two hundred and thirty-nine thousand dollars. Oh wow, I was so yeah, far off. Most people yeah, are, yeah. But great guest nonetheless. Thank you so much Hi. for coming on, Layla. We got a lot to get into, and uh, people may recognize your last name, Hormozzi. We had on Alex twice previously. And I got really excited to have you on because someone told me, I don't remember exactly who it was. Um, it was a business person, entrepreneur person. They said, Layla Hormozzi is a savant in business and entrepreneurship. They said it could be looked over sometimes, but she is a genius in it. And I'm like, you know what? That makes total sense. Of course you would be, right? And I think it'd be interesting to bring you on here, tell your story, how you got to where you are today. And uh, yeah. Yeah, everyone that I've talked to, by the way, is like, oh, you had Alex on, just wait until you have Layla on. Yeah. <laughs> just wait. Like, not it setting, gets even not better. Not trying to put any pressure yeah. on you or anything. Uh, like, yeah, we're not <laughs> setting the bar <laughs> too hard. Yeah. Yeah. But not one person has said anything less than, like, she's a genius. You have to talk to her. You have to have her on the podcast. So here we are. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. But uh, yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, give us a little bit of your backstory yeah. and what led up to everything that has conspired so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we rewind back, um, just to give context, I think sometimes it's, you start a little bit sooner. So I'll go back to when I was in high school. So high school, um, started getting into fitness. I was always overweight as a kid. And so I kind of pursued figuring out, you know, food, working out, all that stuff. And that caught my interest when I was like 13. And so I actually didn't stick with really any sports. I started going to the gym and like lifting by myself. And so that was really the only form of like physical fitness that I did. Um, and then when I was around, I want to say like I learned enough that then when I was at the age of like 18, 19, I ended up losing like 85 pounds. And so first I use that as context because I think going through like a fitness transformation, losing a ton of weight like that and like changing your identity is really similar to becoming you know, someone who's successful in business, right? It's like becoming successful in one area of your life kind of translates over to the other. And so then I went to college for exercise science, thinking that I would attain some kind of skill set that would allow me to like one day have a business, which was very wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to school and I think like two years in, I realized like this is not gonna do anything for me. And so when I went to college and I realized that it was basically useless and there was nothing for me to learn, um, I started you know investing in myself. So I started listening to like Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn, um, and I started really paying attention, like, what do I want to do when I get out of here? Because I kind of was just finishing it for the sake of finishing it. Like, my dad was a professor. Um, and so I got, like, I literally paid, like, 25% of tuition because he worked there. So it was like, you know, I just, honestly, I didn't take it seriously. I wasn't, like, a bad student, but I also mm. wasn't, like, super good. I just, like, thought it was useless. And I was like, I can learn more on my own and from other people that I'm studying right now. And so I did a lot more of that. And then I knew that I wanted to compete in fitness and move out to California. And so I graduated college and I was like, okay, I understand everything about the human body, very useless. Like I got that by now. It's like I'd read enough books that I was like, this isn't really gonna help me a ton because that can only take me so far. I need to learn how to like build a business and market and sell. So I lived in Michigan at that point in time. And I was like, pretty much everyone there was like from at least the town that I was in. It's like, okay, you're either gonna like, you know, maybe take over the small business of your parent, you know, work at Stryker or like work at one of the big automobile places in Detroit. Like it wasn't a lot of opportunity, mm -hmm. um, at least nothing that I wanted to do or apply myself. I didn't see myself in big corporate. So I packed up my Prius at the time. <laughs> nice. And, and uh, I, it was two days after I graduated college, I just drove out to California uh, and got some disgusting, you know, apartment that was like as cheap as I could find that I pulled up and I was like, oh, this is in the ghetto. Great. This is good for like a single, you know, like 21 year old girl. Mm -hmm. um, and I moved there and then I was like, okay, I need to get a job within walking distance because I don't want to pay for gas too much. Cause like I have like $8,000 at this point, which when rent is like 1500 a month, you're like, okay, this isn't going to last too long mm -hmm. with like food and all the other things. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went and I applied at every gym nearby and I was like, I'll just start working at a gym at first because like, I know I could get a job at a gym. Um, and then I'll learn sales. I'll learn sales for the gym. And then eventually I'll learn more about business and have my own business. I didn't know what kind of business, but I just knew I wanted some kind of business. So I ended up getting a job at all the places I applied. And so I tried like a couple of them out for a couple of weeks. Um, and I ended up staying with 24 hour fitness. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm, I'm just curious, why 24-hour yeah. fitness out of all of the, the other locations? Well, I won't say the name of the, some of them, but like one of them I went to and, you know, within like the first few days, I was like, oh, you know, they were basically like, hey, you need to pull down your shirt a little bit, hike up those shorts and you're gonna get those Indian men over there. And I was like, that's not how I, wow. how I flow, man. Okay. So like, I get that that's like extremely, mm. um, 
advantageous in the fitness industry. Like a lot of women are totally fine with doing that. And like, I don't judge them for doing that. That's just like, not me. I just never want to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not how I want to, like, I want to prove that I'm good at business. Not that I can use my body to get business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually ended up sticking with 24 because I really liked the manager there. He was really encouraging and he was like, dude, I can train you so much. And like, I can, you know, teach you my skill set. And he was like, he had basically taken that gym and made it like the top 24 hour fitness for personal training. So I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to sell here. And so I ended up going there and, um, within the first, you know, basically there's like 20 other people that they hired around the same time. And I remember they told me, they're like, you need to go out and get referrals. You need to get like, I don't remember, it was like 15 or 20 referrals. I didn't even know if that was a lot or not at that point in time. But basically in order to do that, um, you have to go up to everyone in the gym and just ask for someone's like name and phone number. And I had no idea at the time that it was even hard to do that or like a thing. And so I think it's really interesting because a lot of people say like, oh, I'm bad at sales. And I'm like, but if you don't know you're selling, which I didn't know I was like selling or getting yeah. leads at that point in time, it wasn't even that hard. And so I ended up being the person that collected the most. And so whatever, I got the job. Yeah. Referrals to what? Uh, referrals for like from members of the gym for people that would be interested in joining the gym. What what was your technique in doing that? Was it just walking up like, hey man, how's it going? Uh, you, you got a friend? You, yeah, you have friends? This, yeah. <laughs> you have any friends? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, like, how do, you, <laughs> how do you? Yeah, how do you do it? Like, what made you stand out when you were doing that? I honestly just didn't yeah. think it was weird. Okay. Like, I just moved there. I was like, I have nothing to lose. These people don't know me. I have no reputation here. Like. What am I going to do? Fail? I mean, and that's, there were two girls that were like crying outside the building. I was like, mm. I went up to them, like, why are you crying? They're like, I don't want to go talk to strangers. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Like, I, I just don't want to be that person. So I was yeah. like, I'm just going to go up and I'm just going to be like, hey, my name's Layla. I'm new here. I'm curious if you have any friends that are interested in joining the gym. That's it. Like, just nice and not yeah. weird. You know, I think a lot of people get like really weird because they're mm. nervous and then mm -hmm. it makes it worse. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, I ended up working there for, uh, I don't know, maybe like 18 months. Um, and then I realized, you know, it was basically like, as soon as you sell enough people that you're full, which became my roster, like my roster was full. Um, then they just have you, you know, selling for other people. And I was like, this is a waste of my time. Like, it's basically like come in as early as possible before you're training, you know, eight sessions a day, sell for other people, build up their rosters. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Did you get paid to beef up other people's rosters? I mean, yeah, you do get paid for it, but you don't okay. get paid ongoing. So it's not very appealing to me. Sure. And I also didn't think a lot of the trainers were that good. So, okay. You know? Yeah. Um, it didn't feel ethical. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, okay, one thing that I learned from, uh, the book, rich dad, poor dad, I, I read that like in the back room of the training. I remember it said like work to learn, not to make money when you're young. And so I was like, okay, I have learned enough here. I get it. I get how this works. I don't want to move up the corporate ladder. They like tried to get me to do all that. And I was like, that sounds horrible. And so I was like, okay, I heard about this guy who had this really great gym and people are like, he's like a fantastic leader and he really knows how to run a business. And like, he has a ton of clients. And I was like, oh, I wanna go learn from that guy. And so uh, I ended up reaching out to him, uh, I wanna say like 18 months into working at 24. And then, you know, did an interview, did a couple and it was obvious we got along really well. And so I went and worked at his gym. And at the same time, I started building up a, like a roster of online clients because my, uh, former coach for, cause I competed in bikini competitions. She was like, you should do this too. I'll feed you a few clients and then you bring your own. And so I was like, okay. So then I started kind of doing both, like learning from her in terms of like online and how that works and how you like get clients online. Mm -hmm. Um, and then learning from him in terms of like, how do you run a business? Which that's what I really got to see when I moved there. And what it allowed me to see was that really interestingly enough is that the same effort it takes to build a small business. It's the same effort to take a big business. And so looking at like 24 hour and looking at a small business, I was like, it's almost harder to have a small business even because there's less opportunity for people. So like less people want to work there because it's a smaller business. So they, they have less opportunity or less runway to like build something for themselves in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you see a lot of churn in small businesses, which makes sense because they're small. So like the vision has to be small as well. So if people have a big vision for themselves, they don't want to work at a small business, which is interesting. Hmm. Um, so anyways, I worked there. Um, and then about not long into it, like, I want to say seven months. Um, I was on Bumble and I basically at this point, I was like, man, I've been single for a little while. I'd been dating when I was in Michigan. When I went to California, I was like, I just want to build up my career. Like I want to be successful. And that was all I really cared about. So I didn't really care about dating. And I didn't really like the guys in the area either. Cause they just wanted some girl that would like shut up and sit and look pretty. And that's not really me. Mm -hmm. So I got on Bumble and I remember my sales manager was like, listen, he's like, this is just like sales. He's like, it's a numbers game. And I was like, that's completely true. <laughs> and so I committed to basically like every day when I had lunch, I was like, I'll sit and I'll just swipe for 30 minutes. Just like, that's it. It's just like swiping and deciding. And so I did that and I went on, gosh, I think I, I did this for like, I don't even know how long until I finally met Alex. I think it was like maybe 13 or 14 months. 
How many Terrible dates date. was that in 13, 14 months? A lot. I mean, at least one a week. So at That's least a 50. lot. That's a lot. Wow. How many of this resulted in a second date? Not many. Really? Okay. Maybe like three. Okay. Yeah. Sure. There was like one guy, you know, I went on like maybe like eight or nine dates with sure. and like, you know, just that kind of stuff. But okay. Yeah. Not too many. What did you learn going on all of these dates? People are weird. No, I'm kidding. People? <laughs> uh, uh I mean, I think what it reinforced for me is just that it is a number team. Like a lot of people are like, I just, you know, you hear women all the time. They're like, I just can't find a man. I'm like, how hard have you tried? Like, did you swipe for 14 months? That's probably not. I think also what I learned is like most people are not picky in terms of what they look for in a significant other. Because most guys were like, well, we're going to go on another date. And I was like, no. And they were like, what? I'm like, oh, you don't want what I want. Like, this is not a match. This is clearly not a match. Mm -hmm. But they were like totally okay with it. <laughs> and I was like, that's so odd. Do you know what you're looking for? Like, have you thought about what you want in this person? And it's like, I would ask them, I'd be like, have you thought about what you want in like a, a girlfriend? And they're like, I mean, you great. You good, look good. You talk. And I'm <laughs> you look like, good and you oh, talk. Yeah, hey, I, I don't know. Done. And I was like, huh, <laughs> okay. And so I think I was just looking for something a little more specific. Which, like, I always knew. I was like, I want someone that's equally as powerful. Like, I don't want to be... In every relationship before I met Alex, I was always, like, the dominant one in the relationship. And I realized, I was like, I don't really want that. I want someone who's almost more dominant than me or at least could be equally powerful. And I'm like, that is something cool. And I think when... That was probably also when, like, power couples started trending on <laughs> Instagram and stuff sure. and Twitter. Um, and so that was what I was really looking for. And so at this point, you know, basically what happened was I swiped uh, on Alex and... He messaged me, or no, I messaged him because it was Bumble. And yeah. so the girl also messaged the guy first. And then, you know, he, it was basically like, he's like, this is stupid being on this platform. Let's talk on the phone. I was like, amazing. I don't want to talk on this platform either. It's such a waste of time. And so he called me and we talked for like 20 minutes. And he was like, I consider this to be like our first date. And I was like, amazing. This is so efficient. So basically we got like all the questions <laughs> out of the way. It's very like, efficient. <laughs> so efficient. Did he, did he well, have a checklist? What did he say to you? I feel like he must have had like a. What did like phone a... call consist of? Like what did you guys <laughs> talk about? Yeah. Um, I think it was mostly like. What are your qualifications? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you. <laughs> How many hours a day do you work? Yeah. I think <laughs> What's your like... sales to, you know, close ratio? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like. Do you want kids? Do you want to get married? What do you see for your life? Like all the basic questions that that would be reasons that people would break up later that they mm -hmm. don't talk about in the beginning. We just talked about that on the first phone call. And so, you know, some of it we weren't completely aligned on at that point in time, but we found, like, found each other enough interesting that I think we were like, yeah, let's go on a date. So then it was just like, let's go meet for Froyo yeah. tomorrow. You kind of went with the flow and Alex kind of initiated that phone call thing. I would imagine being a guy on a dating app, that's not a very effective way to, to find a significant other is just immediately ask for a phone call and ask questions like aspirations in life. I don't know. I mean, I think it might be. I think so. I don't know. Just, you're, you're, I mean, you are yeah. weeding out all the people, yeah. I guess, that like you wouldn't want to. Yeah. With. Also, like, I mean, think about like. Uh, I don't know. I think also like how attractive someone is is going to have something to do with it too. Because like a lot of women will put up with shit and a lot of guys will put up with shit if somebody's good looking. That's a good point. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. A dating app would do really well if they had a questionnaire that you would fill out first that would filter out stuff like that. Like, do you want to get married? Oh, do you want to have kids? Yeah. Do they like, have how those, do though? They do? Yeah, like well, Match.com and well, like Fish and all, so, all the stuff. So, yeah, I guess so. But yeah. like, a, like, a, like a Tinder. No, no where like you would have to uses eHarmony or Match.com. No, I don't think so. But like, I actually tried signing up and I was like, ooh. But yeah. like for a Tinder, if you just 10 questions, right? Like mm -hmm. what are your political views? Would you date yeah. someone with differing viewpoint? Like stuff like that, right? Basics. Would, yeah. yeah I think a wouldn't that do well? would be useful. Yeah. You know what I think would be really, really cool? Um, I'm not single. I'm married now. But... Um, I'm never the type of person that would go to bars or clubs and everybody's meeting people there. Yeah. And I also don't like, like online places, but I think it'd be cool if you went to a place and like, uh, I don't, it could be like fun too. So, uh, it's like a restaurant, but maybe you're seated with other people and it, you could do like single matching or you could do like group matching and meet new friends or something. I don't know. Something like that I think would be cool for you the mean a friend match. Uh, kind of. Yeah. But in person. Yeah. That makes sense. I would probably yeah. attend that. Huh? It, it's, it could also be used for like meeting potential dates too. Cause you could do like a, just like a two seater table, you know, you could be single and then have another single person, or you can go with a group of friends and meet, you know, more friends and get to know about them over dinner. Cause I don't go to clubs and stuff. So. Sounds lovely actually. Mm. Yeah. I like doing the online stuff. It is efficient. Yeah. You I could suppose. just scope people out ahead of time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That's fair. Yeah. So tell us more about this call. So after the call, he's like, we already did the first date, the second date. Yeah, so then we yeah. went for Froyo the next day, which I tried to get out of, and he was like, no. 
Why did um, you try to get out of it? I was. I said I was sick or something. I think I was hungover. <laughs> really? Okay. So yeah. nothing to do with Alex. So you were hungover. Like, you said you were. Sick. I literally I, never drank, yeah. and it was like a friend's birthday, and it was the first time in like eighteen months I drank, and so I was like, I'm sick. He's like, You sound fine. Let's go. I was like, Okay. <laughs> I just liked how assertive he was. I was like, I'm he so said, sick you of- sound fine. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like him. Though. That, I mean, yeah. sounds just like him, but still, yeah. it's just like, it baffles me every time. But I- <laughs> I could you get away though. with that, Jack? Like- like, no, you sound fine. Let's go. <laughs> no. I like that. Jack can not get away with I that. I think that think confidence. Do that. Well, you you have to have the confidence to do that. Think yeah. about this, right? Like I'm a woman who like, I've been looking for a man who can actually like be more assertive with me. Everyone I've dated has been passive. I've always over dominated those people. So like to have somebody who's finally like, no, I, we're going to go do this. And I'm like, I like that. That's nice. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he ended up not forcing you, but like really compelling. <laughs> forcing you. me. Yeah. So selling yeah, you into sure. this, this yeah. Froyo. Pitched right? you. Yeah. Pitched right. you. Yeah. 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 So then we went to Froyo the next day and um, we didn't talk about like relationships at all. We actually just talked about business the whole time. So we like walked for four hours. We had the Froyo. Mm. I don't even think he liked me in the very beginning, actually. Actually, I know he didn't because he walked up and I have a giant back tattoo and he saw my back tattoo. And when he said hi, he was like, hey, I was like no smile i was like this is so odd right and i was like maybe he's having a bad day i don't know and then we went inside and he ate and then afterwards i find out too that you know when his blood sugar is low he's very cranky so i think after he ate it it helped but then he told me he's like why do you have a giant back tattoo and i was like i don't know i was 18. yeah i just felt like getting it um <laughs> what was his response to that shrugged like, it off i think all right you know, okay he's like oh, whatever i'm here right <laughs> Maggie's like you could get that removed <laughs> yeah, what are your plans you tomorrow no, you <laughs> you'll, get, <laughs> you'll get that removed yeah yeah i met his dad the first time i met his dad he yeah. came from behind he sees me he goes we can get this removed and doesn't even say hi not like hi, no he just goes we can get this removed wow <laughs> yeah. which by the way so you know I'm where like, he where alex gets it from yeah 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 did uh, have you gotten it removed no dude i went through like one session and the guy yeah. was like he was like, well, we could do it now, uh, but you won't be numb. But like, if you come back, you know, we can numb. It's going to be a few weeks out because I'm booked. I was like, how bad is it? And he was like, it's not that bad, you know. And I was like, <laughs> okay, it's, it's only my whole back. Like, yeah. let's just try. Yeah. So he did like a little thing. And I was like, wow, that's terrible. And then I was like, just do it. So I sat there and like, no, it was the, it was the worst pain I've ever had in my life. Wow. I always thought terrible. that they should have just one massive laser for something like that yeah. instead oh, of gosh. doing it one at a time. And it's just like, you know. <laughs> And it just does the entire session right there. Yeah. You know, imagine or they you just, bite on a towel or something. Like, you just knock me out. Like, this is actually like, yeah, pretty aggressive. Like it feels like point. bacon yeah. grease is just popping on your back. Really? Okay, That's nice. what it feels like? Wow. Yeah. Uh, identical. I've always been so curious in what it's like. Yeah, I've heard it's very painful. Oh, I would yeah. not. I was like, I must. Yeah. Numbing heated cream is like required. I get those videos oh, recommended to me on TikTok now. Yeah. Because I started watching them. It's so addicting to be like, like they just go through the, like, I want to just watch it done. You know, no, you don't. I, it's, inter- I, it's just I, interesting. Like, I like yeah. stood up and it was just sweat. Like, and Alex wow. was like, he almost told the guy to stop because he was there, and I was just like convulsing because it like the way that it, it hits your nerves, and so you just like yeah. you like flop. flop Is this thing like straight up shoulders to like you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wow. angel wings. So. Wow. Okay. Super tacky. So, I, I, so, so Alex, yeah. when he was on here, I think he mentioned that we, pretty early on in the first couple dates, I think I think he might have said like the second date, um, he said that. He had to like do something for for like a business he was running or something, and uh, that you just like kind of went along with it. So how did that come up? What did you think going on? You know, one of the first dates with this person and just being like told like, "Hey, I'm working on this." You Roped into this their business. Me? Yeah. How did that make yeah. you feel? And and did you feel intimidated or did you th- did you like that he took charge? Um, <clears throat> intimidated? No, I, I actually was like, he asked me to pick up all the cash from his. That's gyms. what it was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I more like called him. And I was like, bro, I was like, you don't even know me. I was like, why are you asking me to pick up the cash? I was like, I'm I'm happy because he was out of town. He was like, yeah. I have to drop it by the bank by this day. Do you think you could help me out? And I was like, sure, but like, I, that's a lot of money. Like, are you tr- You don't even know me. And he was like, I know you won't steal. And I was like, interesting. And I picked up the money. I was like, that's a lot of money. I was like, if I were not a good person, I was like, I don't, how does yeah. he even know? So I mentioned to Alex, I kind of thought, you know, that was him being like, yeah, pick up my cash from the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, a hundred grand here. <laughs> this guy's really <laughs> yeah. killing it. You know, you take it to the bank. Do you yeah. think, you know, what was it just, he needed a, a hand with this? I mean, I think that he was trying to figure out if he wanted, he was like, cause you know, basically on the first date, he's like, we should work together. Like I want to start this new business. You seem like you can sell and you understand business and you like all this. He's like, you should do it with me. And I was like, we just met. Like, I just feel like I, I was like, that's a lot. Like, I'm, I'm doing these other things. I'm not sure. Um, and so I think he, like, kept slowly trying to just, like, get me to, like, start working and doing stuff with him. So I feel like it was a little bit of that and just, like, necessity. Mm. Like, I don't think 
like we both didn't have like a ton of friends at that point in time so it was like when we got on three dates and might as well did you worry that maybe there's something illegal going on like he's having you go and pick up cash from different locations <laughs> yeah. and like bring it somewhere no. did that that never crossed your mind no they were gyms i like went in there's like people training people Gym, like, yeah, yeah. Gym, that's yeah. the cover right yeah, 100%, yeah. <laughs> the real alex wow. was exposed on this episode right. of Ice coffee <laughs> But first, Alex and I want to thank today's sponsor, Moomoo. Moomoo helps you monitor market movements, perform deep technical analysis, screen for stocks that you like, and it gives you a community where traders can exchange ideas. Another great feature is you also get access to global assets, meaning you'll be able to trade in Hong Kong and the U.S. stock market all from the same app. And that's actually really cool for me because there are some stocks on the Hong Kong market that I would love to buy. And best of all, when you deposit just $100, Moomoo will give you up to seven free stocks. Each stock is worth at least $8 all the way up to $2,500. So it's literally free money. They also have a 24-7 real-time financial news page. So you can keep up to date with all that finance news you might need for your trades. From places like Bloomberg, Dow Jones, Reuters, CNBC, and some other credible news sources. All in one place. Moomoo even has a 24-7 online customer service line where you can live chat chat with their team if you ever need anything. So get up to 10 free stocks from Moomoo using the link down below in the description. Again, guys, the link is down below in the description to get up to 10 free stocks. Thank you so much, Moomoo. And back, back to, to the, the podcast. podcast. So yeah. that was like the second date ever, basically. He already hired you to, to go pick up some cash for him. And then how did this evolve into what it is today and now you guys are building these crazy huge businesses yeah i mean i think you know basically we started gym launch and after alex got rid of all his other businesses because he had like a bajillion um and that was very like it took a ton of attention from him and so i actually end up you know fast forward i end up six weeks into us knowing each other uh quitting the gym that i was at uh stopping anything with online personal training and i just went all in on gym launch um and then i think it took him probably close to like a year to shed everything that he was doing. Um, but he did because it was also like, you know, every time that he like was like, I don't know if I want to grid this. I was like, did I quit my job? And like, I gave away all my clients to do this because of this idea. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was, it was really cool once he finally got those things off his plate. And then we realized that we have really great complementary skill sets. And I think that evolved over time because in the beginning it was like, I, we both could kind of do the same thing. So we just split stuff up. And then as Gym Launch ended up taking off, which it was just a concept for 18 months, you know, when it was basically just like eating shit. And then 18 months in, you know, we changed the model and then it just took off. You know, we stopped flying people out to the gyms and instead we started, we turned it into basically uh, like an education business or a, a licensing model where we licensed the IP to them and then we coached them through the program. And that was when we said, okay, we're not gonna be able to do the same thing and split it anymore. We're gonna kind of split roles because mm -hmm. we understand that's what a business needs in order to function. And so that's when basically, you know, we wrote everything on a whiteboard that happens with the business. And it was like marketing, sales, finance, HR, ops, you know, customer success, tech, all that. And then uh, one of our friends just circled marketing and was like, this is Alex. And then all the rest is Layla. And they were like, that's how you split it. And I was like, okay. And, and that was what kind of stemmed how we work together. And then like me going into learning the other parts of a business, because I understood marketing and sales fairly well at that point. Not as well as him because he had his six gyms, right? So he'd had to market and sell for those. But I understood it better than most people. Um, but I didn't understand literally anything else. And so that's when I just went into learning and like investing in, you know, reading books and studying, like, how do you run the rest of a business? How do you grow and scale a business? Um, and that became kind of my hat. And then his hat, you know, continued and always went further into marketing. And it's just worked incredibly well. And like, we actually really enjoy doing it together. And so we just haven't stopped. At what point did you guys start like, dating though because it seems like yeah, yeah in the beginning it was like a business venture i mean it's kind of weird honestly because like we were dating during the whole first year but like more working together listen this is the thing me and alex both our ambitions are always going to be what's most important to both of us and so i think until we realized that we were both useful in terms of helping each other achieve our ambitions it's kind of like our ambitions are always going to be first but once you realize that that person is going to actually help you achieve your ambitions putting that person first and partnering with them and putting the partnership first becomes more of a priority. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how yeah. long would you say it took for that to, that to occur where you put each other before the ambition? Maybe two and a half years. Wow. Two and a half years. It's not like yeah, a normal yeah. relationship right. that I'm like totally oh, yeah. aware of, but it works. Yeah. So how did you then scale this business and what, what was your role exactly? Yeah. Uh, so we had the titles of co-CEOs. And so how we divided it was really Alex is 
top of funnel. So he's going to make it rain, right? That's always what Alex is going to do. Um, in gym launch specifically, Alex also was like the face of the product for the beginning. So until we brought in like coaches and had them basically redo all the product, he was the face of the product. So he was like in all the videos. So Alex was in all the videos. He was running the marketing and I did the rest of it. And so that's how we've always split it because he's definitely somebody who like, he needs to focus on one thing. So it's like, I always, in any business that we start, I'm like, I'm gonna try and get Alex like in a corner focusing on one thing, because that's what he likes doing. Like he likes writing his books, he likes promoting, he likes making content, like he likes doing that stuff. I like the rest of it. I like the people stuff, I like building teams, I like hiring leaders, I like doing all of those things. And so that's how we've run all of the businesses. In, in terms of gym launch, it was a little bit in the beginning of us overlapping, mm -hmm. and then learning that we had to let go of things in order to be more effective just as a business. You know, it's like we had to define our own roles, have our own job descriptions. You know, basically, like if you look at if we weren't in a relationship, how do we run the business? That's just what we did because we're like, mm -hmm. that's going to make the business successful is if we're partners that we clearly define our roles and then we give each other autonomy to make decisions in those areas. Does that make sense? Yeah. How often do you guys get in disagreements? And if you are at a stalemate, who makes that decision? We actually were given a really great piece of advice early on, which was, if you don't agree, don't move forward. And so people ask us that all the time, especially mm. if they're interested in working for us. They're like, how do you guys as co-founders and as married a married couple like make decisions? We're like, there's an, honestly not one like final decision maker. We just wait until we agree on something. Like we continue to work the idea or the problem until we both like it and then we move forward. And that means like, I, I can think of the biggest time that we had a disagreement was with Alan launching the software company. Um, which I think I've talked about this before, but basically like I just, when we had a minimum viable product, I looked at everything that had to happen in order to make it a scalable business. And I was like, I don't think it's worth it. I don't, I think we're going to incur like millions of dollars. We'd already put like $4 million into this thing. And I was like, it's going to cost way more. And I don't think that we're going to see the return we want. And the market moves so fast in tech and tech is not our strong suit that I didn't believe it was like a great you know, venture. And he was like, I think it is. And he, cause he's always more optimistic. I'm usually mm -hmm. more pessimistic. And so we like locked ourselves in a room for like three days. And then finally I was like, screw it. Like, okay, the, the deal was that we would launch it and we would try and build it and scale it. But if it didn't become profitable within four months, we would shut it down. And so like, <laughs> it's kind of funny because mm. literally like at month two, I was like, dude, it's not looking good. You know? <laughs> and he was yeah. like, he just like dove in and it became extremely profitable. Um, and so we ended up growing it to an extent and then selling it, but we sold it because again, it just wasn't our strong suit. Sure. So we always look back, we're like, who was right, who was wrong? It's like, neither mm -hmm. nor, yeah. right? But um, but it did make money, so it made yeah. a profit. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. It ended up doing that. It was okay. just very uh, painful is probably the right word sure. because we don't have, we're not like technical experts. You know, like I'm great at running a business and the operation side of things and he's great at marketing and there was no product person. Yeah. And so if we had started with a product person, I think it would have done like, I think it would have crushed, um, but we just, we didn't do that. We didn't know. Yeah. Then what about the decision to sell everything, scale back? How involved were you in that process? What were your thoughts on that? Super involved. Um, I actually, you know, I think that he probably wanted to like sell the house before me. Um, I think part of it was like wanting to feel like, like I had for a long time, or at least for like a few years of our marriage, because it's only been like six years. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, I had this image of like, I want to be, like of the perfect CEO, the perfect wife, the perfect, you know, employer, the perfect boss, like all these things. And part of being like the perfect wife and the perfect, like, I don't know, just human that I was envisioning was like having this huge house that was like very impressive that people could walk into. And so I think finally what was like the tipping point for me was realizing how much of my attention was going to that house. And I think one of my friends, I was talking to her one day about it and she's like, do you know how much more valuable your attention is on the business? And I was like, I agree with you. And so I think at that point, then it just became a nuisance to me because I was like, I'm so sick of taking care of this. Like I'm not a traditional wife. And I think it was like, I resisted that for a long time because I'm around all these other wives who like, they don't run businesses. They don't, they're like, they run a business with their husband, but like mm. they don't run the business with their husband. They're actually like doing something else. And like, they have lots of free time to take care of the house, which is great. That's just not me. And I think for a long time, I didn't accept that about myself. Once I accepted it, I was like, screw this. I was like, I'm not cooking dinner anymore. I don't want this house. I don't want this car. Cause I want to take care of this. And so now I realize there are other, other ways to do that. But I, in hindsight, I'm glad that we did it because it was like a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And it's also because like, you know, we knew that we were gonna sell the businesses and I was like, I want a fresh start. Like, I feel like I'm like gym launch Layla in this house and acquisition.com Layla, 
doesn't live in this house. She doesn't do this shit. She doesn't cook this dinner like this. She doesn't do any of this. And so it's much easier to change your life if you change your environment. At least we both tend to think that. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, moving, selling the house, getting rid of all the cars and everything, like just doing a fresh start, I think was like really good for turning the page to the next chapter. Yeah. And now you're living in uh, middle of Las Vegas Strip. What is that like? It was awful. In a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't like it at all. But Alex had always wanted to try Las Vegas. And I was like, listen, I'm flexible. And like, I just always am one of those people. I'm like, I'm not going to not try something once. So we got like a lease. And I was like, what is it? I can do anything for a year. Um, And so we moved there. At first, I didn't like it because it was very loud and very like busy. Mm -hmm. Um, And now it's odd. It's like, I actually really like it. Really? Yeah. What do you like the most about it? Everybody always comes to Las Vegas and everybody always stays on the strip. So the amount of like networking, the amount of people that we can see and things that we can do, the amount of activities that there are that you can do on the strip. I actually really like that. And so Mm. it's like if people come in, you know, you you know where to take them, you know what to do. There's lots that you can do. You don't have to like entertain people in your home. And I love being able to walk to everything versus, you know, we were kind of isolated in the suburbs before when we were in Austin, which I was not a big fan of. Mm. Yeah, I would find it so weird just to like take an escalator or, or take an elevator down and like there's thousands of people that are just a few stories mm-hmm. below you. It is a little weird, it seems but here's just the thing an at the odd same time. mindset. Yeah. Yeah. People think of the strip, they think of like, you know, the Mirage and the, like we live in the other side where it's a little nicer, a little more quiet. Yeah. So it's like our like very intermediate surrounding area is more of the nicer side of the strip, hmm. which I don't want to yep. talk about what it is, but yeah. That's yeah. fair. I want to talk a little bit more about business operations because you say mm-hmm. that's kind of what you do with now it's acquisition.com. Previously was Jim Launch. Yeah. What do you think you're uniquely good at within business operations and how did you get good at those things? You said hiring was mm-hmm. one of them. You think that you're Yeah. Like, I think I think it's a couple I think probably good at picking people. Mm-hmm. I think I'm fairly probably more competent than most people at hiring mm-hmm. for sure. Um and then also managing people. Like mm-hmm. I really think that's it. I think it's just like it's building the team, right? And I think that doing that and aligning it with the strategy of the business is something that I feel really good at doing. Like I can, I know where the business our projections are for like three to five years from now. And I'm like, oh, I know what the team's gonna look like. I, I can map it out on a piece of paper and do that. I would say it's probably like my bigger advantage. Um, I'd be interested in what my team would say actually. I'm like, what would they say? What do you look for in a person? Like, is there a quality? Yeah. And how do so, you build out the team and the culture of the team? Yeah, it starts with you. Which is like the weird, okay, what I hate is that there's like an art and a science to this, right? The culture is the art side. And I think that a lot of people, there is a, obviously science, there's like you can do these things, but if the heart isn't there and the intention isn't there, that's not gonna happen. And so I think a lot of times it's very misconstrued because people see like a Jeff Bezos or an Elon Musk and they're like, oh, the culture and all these things. I'm like, but he's, a, he's honestly an outlier. Most people that have very big businesses are just people of like elite character. Because people want to, people that have elite talent want to work for people with elite character, right? So if you think about it, like I think about my job, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room, but I need to be of sound enough mind and competent enough that the smartest person in the room wants to work for me. And that I've created a big enough vision that their vision for however smart they are Mm -hmm. can fit within mine. So I look at that as my job. I'm like, that's what I do. Um, And I think that when you think about building a culture Oftentimes, it's just, it continues, the culture, it's like you start at the top, and it just continues to dilute all the way down. And the culture is really just the mission and the vision and the values of the co-founder or of the founder or of the person that's, you know, whatever, head honcho of the business, whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. right? And so it just continues to drip down. And so the more potent you can be in terms of how you exemplify those values and that mission, the more that you can repeat it over and over again, the stronger a culture you're going to have, because it's going to the next level is going to be like a little diluted and then like a little more diluted and then like a little more. So the bigger the organization, that's why you see that people lose the mission and the values. It's unless you make it an immense effort. And it starts with the person at the top, unfortunately. It's like nobody's going to exemplify those values more than the person at the top. It's mm. like you think about it. It's just, I've seen it so many times. It's just it, nobody will work for you that has better values than you. They will go find somebody else who has better values. And within operations of a business, if you see that dichotomy of like culture and talent, would you be able to say one is more important than the other? It's a good question. I thought of I that think question. That culture, you did? I think that I, I, I without culture, talent fails. Interesting. So it you just think, becomes a very cold environment. So you think culture is probably more important mm-hmm. than talent? Yeah. I'm just wondering, it's like if, if you're building a business or if I'm trying to create a team, how can I radiate 
that that positive culture that you're saying or like constantly be instilling the values of the company into the employees of the company? Is it like actual like board meetings? Like more specifically, what exactly is it? Yeah, like tactically, if you're looking at it, like it, it really is down to the tactics, which is like first you start with, you know, quarterly meetings like this mm -hmm. sounds so lame, but like that's really how you do. It's like you have an annual meeting. You've got quarterly meetings in each of those. You're reiterating the mission, the vision, the values over and over again. And you're showing how all of the goals of the business tie into those values, tie into that mission. And so those values and that mission are actually decision making filters to decide, are these the priorities that we need to follow as a company? Do they align with the values and do they relate to the mission? If the mission is we want to help a thousand women lose weight and someone says, well, I want to start a men's weight loss program. It's like, but it's help women lose weight, not men. So that means that decision's out. And so a lot of people just think they're like these foo-foo things. I'm like, no, these are the principles that we use to make decisions for the company. And so they should always be prominent because that's what, so I'll give you an example, right? With acquisition.com, it's sincere candor, unimpeachable character, and then competitive greatness. And so every time we're picking a CEO portfolio company, we run them through that filter. We have a scorecard mm -hmm. and it literally has those as the filter. It's like, do they fit those values? Would they be something that we're proud to associate with? Do they have sincere candor? Are they being transparent with us? And then do they want more than money? Are they actually competitively great? And the same goes for hiring is that I have a little scorecard. It's like, do they fit the values? And that's always the first question. It's like, it doesn't matter how skilled they are. If they don't fit the values, they just can't work here. And so I think it's, it's that. And then when I talk about those quarterly meetings, those get broken down into, you know, on a monthly basis, I think that most companies should be running what I call as like a vision meeting, which is again, reiterating the vision. It's just repetition of the vision to the entire company. And then talking about the vision, breaking it down to the actual mission and then the values, and then giving examples of decisions that were made that month that relate to that. It's like, Hey guys, mm. we decided not to do this because of this value. And then calling people out. It's like Sally actually did this this month, which relates to our value number two. You know, Harry didn't do this because he realized it didn't relate to our value or it didn't tie into our mission. Does that make sense? That makes yeah. sense. It's like you're yeah. just always using those as like the guiding light and tying every decision back to them of why we do or do not do something in a company. That's really interesting. Mm. You have like your overarching goal or mission and every action that is taken within the business should always be serving yes. that main goal. Absolutely. I think we could do that a little bit better. Probably do that I, better, because okay. you yeah. said like quarterly yeah. meetings within us. It's like we go out, we do dinners on occasion. Like I'm seeing Graham fairly often. I'm seeing Alex like fairly often. Yeah. But we never like allocate or reserve time specifically to just discuss the intricacies of the business. And I feel like that's on. what we always talk about, though. It's what we talk about, but yeah. I feel like it's it's more conversational than it is. it is like an actual. Yo, we're doing a business. Yeah. Meeting. You know what I mean? Yeah. What is the mission? <laughs> well, that's Make a, that's a, a great, uh, that's a great to, question. I'll defer this I'm so, one to you, Graham. so glad you asked <laughs> this question, isn't it, Jack? Yeah. That it's a great well, question, Alex. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. To be honest with you, I mean, the mission yeah. has always just been continue having fun and, and growing. I mean, I always yeah. put just enjoyment over anything. Okay. So just, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously it would be cool to hit a million subscribers, but I think you have to enjoy it. And for me, it's it's really enjoyment first. And as long as I see growth month over month, as long as we're, you know, on an upward trajectory, we're continue, continuing to do well and, and just growing, I'm happy with it. Mm -hmm. I think it's growth for me. I would say like the overall mission of the Ice Coffee Hour. Getting on as many platforms as possible, getting as many views, having on the best quality guests that we can, providing the most in, like amount of entertainment and educational value for the viewers, just growth. Yeah. Why is growth important? Because I think that happiness is derived from growth, yeah, and productivity. I think forward. I like I like watching the progress. To me, it's a bit like a challenge to see month over month, or even like you know six months over six months. Are we doing better? If not, why? And trying to figure that out. It's like a piece of a puzzle yeah. that you could you could figure out and grow. And but I think at the end of the day, for me, it's just like, do you have fun doing it? Is it something that I look forward to? And if it's I'm a yes, then I continue doing it. I think that's a value. Like okay. the fun piece is totally a value. Like sure. we have a company and their values pig in the mud fun. Right. But they have like a huge vision. It's just like, Hey, if we're not having fun, like we want to make sure we have fun while we get there. Values are basically constraints of how you get to the vision. Mm. So it's like, we can get to a billion dollar company or make this, you know, somehow turn it into a billion dollar company as long as we're having fun. Cause that's a constraint we're putting on ourselves. Like, Hey, we're going to get there, but we have fun along the way. If we're not having fun, that's not aligned with the mission. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Seems to be deep in It'd thought, be interesting Jack. If yeah. you actually like wrote it yeah. down and you were like, "This is our mission," and like, because here's the thing: is That's at some point idea. you're gonna hit a million subscribers, you're gonna hit these numbers you're talking about, and then what? Then you See, just bump it up. 
Yeah, then it turns into have fun. That's that's a yeah. goal or a KPI. A mission sure. is something above that. It's like why even set the goal or KPI? Sure. What's the greater vision beyond it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's usually very amorphous, and that's totally fine. But it's just like you can attract better people, better talent, and then like align with that. I feel like you guys already have everything that's there. It's just not written down mm-hmm. or structured. You know? Yeah. Great suggestion. Hone it in. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, honing yeah. it in. Yeah. It gives people so much clarity because so many opportunities come in to every business owner. They come their way, and people are always like, "How do you say no to opportunities?" I'm like. I just run it through the decision filter. It's like, does it align with the mission or the values? If it does, then maybe it makes sense for us to pursue. If it doesn't, then we say no to it. Even mm. if it's a great opportunity, it's not our opportunity. Yeah. I will say one thing that's kind of interesting is if we record a podcast and I think that podcast did like, or I think that it was extremely entertaining or extremely educational and it doesn't perform that well, it still makes me feel better than an episode where I feel like we didn't do that much, but it still gets a lot of views. Mm. Mm. I will say that. So maybe it is just providing as much value and, uh, as possible i get that because i make be videos it. that like nobody watches but i'm like this is so good yeah. it's very valuable <laughs> so, yeah yeah you were telling us though that you don't even watch youtube you don't watch tiktok you stay off of all of that i forget what we mentioned oh it was a Instagram. mukbang we were talking yeah, about we were doing talking a mukbang and ASMR, so like, I, I don't know You're what like, that is i don't even know what that is yeah. i don't watch youtube I'm like mukbang you know is there a reason why you stay away from like tiktok or youtube it's not uh, like a tool that's helping me get to my goals. Yeah. I guess, like, you run it so. through the decision filter. It's not. I honestly, yeah. you know, I, I don't have a, if I need to learn something, I will pick like what platform I, need, I could probably find something on. I will go learn it. But it's mm-hmm. not like, I don't like have fun on social media. Like for me, social media is like, I only f- think about putting out content that adds value to other people. And that's the only like purpose I see social media for. I don't see it for like my own entertainment, if that makes sense. Mm. That's interesting because. I always, I always find it really interesting when people that are really successful at social media don't consume social media because I feel like you need to consume social media in order to see what is good. That's what I, I think. Grow. Yeah. I would it's grow like, way faster if yeah. I did. I study like yeah. all the time. I'm like always trying to network and talk to other like podcast producers and stuff like that. And even studying podcasts and like how they break down their conversation. Like I'm yeah. always looking at stuff like that. And I would imagine it's pretty hard to try to scale on social media if you aren't like allowing yourself or consuming any of it. Yeah. But that's not my goal. I mean, like I'm, I'm putting stuff out there because I think that it's, I want to represent the other side of our business. Mm-hmm. Like me and Alex talked about when we started acquisition.com, which is, it's basically like the two of us split the role of CEO. And so mm-hmm. people only see what he does and they assume, oh, that's all I need to be successful. And, and we talked about it. We're like, when we start acquisition.com, I was like, I want to put a presence out there, but it's not my number one priority right now because I'm growing and scaling our business. And so mm-hmm. like my team is my priority right now and that like growing sense. the team and growing the portfolio companies. And I would sacrifice social media any day to make sure that I put them as a priority. So it's just like, what's my priority? It would be his priority, right? Cause like Alex is more top of funnel than I am. So like it for, should for sure be his, he's on the platforms way more than me. He understands marketing to a different extent than I do. Um, I listen to what he says. I listen to our team. I listen to like Caleb and Quinn and everyone that we have. And I look to them. I'm like, what do you guys think? Like, mm-hmm. what, what content do you think I should be making? That's why I ask them because I'm like, I, I don't know. What's valuable? Hmm. So what is your goal over the next 10 years? Like your mission? Yeah. I want to be the CEO of acquisition.com when it hits a billion. And how are you going to do that? How are you going to get to a billion? Um, it's a fairly, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we could do it. So, I mean, we could have, uh, I think it's a hundred companies doing, you know, 30 million a year. We could have, you know, 50 companies that are each doing, uh, 40 or 50 million a year. I mean, like there's a lot of different ways math wise it works mm-hmm. out. I think right now what we're doing is we're taking minority interest in smaller companies. And so it's like more of a volume game. But what I would like to eventually do is take majority stake in bigger companies. Because here's the thing I've realized is that scaling a smaller company and scaling a bigger company, it's the same work. And like, honestly, I can do both. And so I feel like, but what I have to do is I have to build the team that can do both. Right now, I think our infrastructure supports uh, scaling the companies that are you know below 100 million. But I think we can get the level of talent to scale companies beyond 100 million and like take them to. You know, I would love to get a company to a billion. That would be so sad. Yeah. What sort of companies do you go after? Um, we've actually just broadened it. So it was more service based, educational, etc. And at the last quarterly, I was like, I feel like this is very limiting because we can take technology, we can take you know physical goods. It's just it's more about the business itself. A lot of technology businesses and physical goods businesses have really crappy margins and really bad economies of scale. And so oftentimes they end up going under because they just, one, they take on like VC money if you're tech. And then if you're a products business, you have like loans and lines of credit constantly going in and out. And so it's like, there's not much left over at the end of the day. And so to reinvest in like building, you know, a talent pool and stuff without taking on more debt, which is not something I'm comfortable with asking people to do, it's really hard. And 
our method of growing a company is basically we want to take it to its organic max before we take it to its basically like leveraged maximum. Mm -hmm. So every company has like an organic max where it's like if you've seen an S curve in a company, right? It's like the product is like doing great. It's going up. And then all of a sudden, like it starts to go down, decline. People start eating away at your market share. Competitors come in. You start to see that your, your clients are leaving for other people. And then the goal is to then basically build a new S curve and overlap the two. And if you can overlap the two, then you can go from, say, usually the first S curve for a lot of businesses that I'd be talking to, it'd be like 50 million. And then they get to 50 million, around 45, they start to see a decline. And they can hit 50 with like, you know, a ton of grit. And then at that point, it's like you need something new to scale to 100 million and beyond. And so um, the goal is really to just take them to the organic max. What it, what it is is that a lot of companies, they don't go to their organic max. They get to like two, three million. And then they're like, we're going to get all this VC money and we're just going to throw money at everything. And the thing is, if you've seen the inside of some of those companies, it takes someone very disciplined to not solve problems with just money. And if you solve problems with just money, the company is basically built on stilts. And how do you help all of these businesses scale? Where do you find all the time to do that? Time? Yeah. Well, we have a team. Okay. So yeah, we have a team. It's not like it's just me and Alex. It's, sure. not, it's not at all. How big is um, your team? Uh, 12. Hmm. It's mostly comprised of consultants. So people who specialize in like strategy and certain areas of business, they can help scale those areas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like you look at like McKinsey or Bain or like some of those firms. That's what we're going for, but like a new kind of consulting PE. Sure. And walk us through an average day now, like what your schedule looks like, how many hours you work. Yeah. Um, usually I wake up at like five, I want to say. Um, and then I really like to just get to work for like, I don't know, three hours maybe. And then at like eight or nine, I go to the gym. Uh, and usually I'm like walking, doing emails, and then I go lift. Um, then I come back and I shower and then I take calls from usually like uh, I don't like to do them any earlier than 10 if I don't have to because I'd like to get my work done in the morning. Um, but like 10 to uh, maybe like 5.30. And then I go on a walk. And then usually we have some sort of like dinner or event or something in the afternoon. Um, and then we do that. And then we come home and Alex and I like debrief with each other. And then that's it. I have a question. Um, what, so we had Alex on. He said he would consider himself a nihilist. Would you consider yourself a nihilist? I don't like identify with that term. I think that I have beliefs that would be aligned with that, but I don't like think about myself or identify. I don't label myself with any label. So that's probably mm -hmm. actually why, but do we share the same beliefs mostly? But I think he's, Alex is more philosophical than I am. Like I actually try to get out of my head cause I can overthink and go into that really deep. And I don't like to as much just like, I don't think most things matter yeah. and you can just assign whatever meaning you want to. Like you get to choose whatever meaning that you have and assign it to whatever occurs. I do believe that. Um, I don't think anything has like inherent meaning. Um, but I don't think about that all the time because if you stay stuck in there, it's just like a very, like, I don't want to be a, you know, I tell Alex, I'm like, I don't want to be a philosopher. You yeah, know, yeah. like that's not, that's not my <laughs> vibe. Yeah, yeah. I want to be a, a business person. So, um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do think that serves me. Yeah, now I overheard earlier when you walked in, you saw Bailey, the puppy. You got a puppy too. Could you yeah. tell us the story? You said you just brought brought a puppy home. Yeah. <laughs> Alex so, wasn't a big fan or something. No, he, he uh. loves dogs and that's why he doesn't want one. Um, so there was like a period of time right before we got married that Alex and I, he basically was like, I need to tie up some loose ends or something. He like wanted to talk to like an ex because he had been engaged before we met. Mm. And I was like, talk to an ex. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so he's like, I, you know, I'm going to meet her uh, at some place, whatever. And, and I'm going to like, you know, close things off because they just left it. Like maybe we'll get back together because they'd been on and off for so long. And I was like, pretty sure we're just breaking up. And so when he was gone, I was like, okay. And I just like went to get my own apartment and I got a dog and he came back. <laughs> And he was like, I closed things off. I want to get married. And I was like, wait, what? And I was so confused. I was like, wait, dude, come on. How Who long like was he says... gone for? Two days. Two days? Where did he wait, go? Oh, he flew and then came back the next day. Oh, my god! But he was previously engaged to this woman. Mm -hmm. What was there to close off? Did you guys have a discussion? Like, why? Like, why? Back. Why I mean, that couldn't was what he... I was saying the whole time, right? I was <laughs> yeah, like, gonna... okay, what, you're going to close something off? You know, like, I'm just like, <laughs> it seems there like a weird thing to it. just not to say, like, uh, you know, shoot a text or Legal something like that. Or like a. Or... Well, you know, I think um, I don't know much about the situation because I don't, I don't like tend to ask about people's past. I think that, you know, it was his situation. He wanted to handle his way. Um, and I think 
he handled it very maturely, which was that person felt like there wasn't closure. And so he was like, I feel that she deserves to hear from me in person. And I'm going to tell her why she needs to move on. And she is with somebody else who I think wanted to get married with her. And she was like, do I do that? Or we ever, do we ever have a future? And I don't know. I and don't, he could probably yeah. tell it better than me. My memory's not like 100% sure. on it. Because like, I was just more like, well, obviously we're broken So within up. these two yeah. days, you got your own apartment and a dog. I didn't get the own apartment. I like went and viewed them. And oh. then I got a dog. Because I was like, I wanted a dog. I was like, well, so now you I'm thought, gonna, I was like, yeah. I'm going to be single. You thought it was over? Get a dog. Huh? You thought it was over? Yeah. But he told you he was just going to come back, right? Just, okay, but how many people, when they're like, oh, I have to go close things off with my ex, you're like, okay. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I just was but thinking myself. But that's pretty insane. Yeah. Like, you accepted the fact that it was over. You got a dog, and then he comes back, and you're like, all right, let's go. You know? Well, I kind of realized that I just, like, let my own mind get the best of me. Oh. I mean, how many. That makes sense. Like, think about, like, every relationship I'd had prior to that, if somebody had said something like that, like, I, I did have people who were unfaithful and, like, did things like that. So I was like, mm. oh, I've seen this before. Okay. But it, this on. wasn't the case. You just noticed that as soon as he came back, you're like, well, I already got the dog. So Yeah, and I think that was like a huge moment where I gained a lot of trust with him because mm -hmm. I was like, he's, a, I mean, Alex is like, he's never cheated on anyone. He's always been very faithful. He's always been very forthright about that, that he would never do that to somebody. And I always was like, wow, he's very aggressive about this fact about himself when we met. And that kind of showcased it to me because I was like, he came back and he was just like, he seemed like much more clear of head. And he's mm -hmm. like, I feel like really good about this now. And like, I can completely focus on this because when we met he was like i wasn't really looking for a relationship i was just looking for a distraction yeah from this relationship that i was like exiting yeah does that make sense how has being married changed your relationship or has it no okay has not why i'm curious i'm, I'm curious engaged i'm yeah. yeah well i'm engaged now so i'm curious if you've seen a, a shift or something i think if anything yeah. you just allows you a level of intimacy that's beyond what you had before because there's this whether it's false or not a bigger sense of certainty and security with the person because you're mm -hmm. like we're married like it's almost like a like <laughs> it used to just be like okay together and then you could break up now it's like together and it's like if you even had the thought of breaking up you're like wait but we're married it's almost like a stopgap mm -hmm. i, I want to say and yeah. so you're like you would have to take things more seriously and like consider things and try much harder in order to end the relationship and i do think that most people actually don't try very hard to save relationships so i do think there's Got valid it. yeah there's okay. validity to it okay uh, what other marriage advice do you have? I don't or know anything I have that's advice. is everything that's, okay? Greg? Yeah, everything's, everything's on. I'm just curious. Well, I'm just curious. Everything's, everything's like, going great, Jack. Okay, yeah. Cool, yeah. Except let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you about this thing. Let me just complain for a second. <laughs> um, the way I see marriage yeah. is like this: if you study, I think that marriage is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And so, if you look at the best teams of all time, how do they structure? Like, what are they built off of? And I think it's the same things, which is it's like you have a shared mission, shared values. And then shared lifestyle or interests, basically. So it's like shared mission is that you're both going towards the same thing in life. There's something that you've decided that you can have your own ways of getting there and you have your own paths, but you both want to end up at the same place, right? And so you have this goal, this vision that you can both kind of like ideate over together. Below that is like we have shared values, which is we agree that we abide by these values to get to that vision, right? So like while we're on our paths there, these are the ways that we're going to behave in order to achieve the mission, which is like, say we want to get rich. We're like, oh, we want to have a billion dollars. But it's like, hey, we're also going to be ethical, right? So it's like, yeah. we're not going to sell cocaine to get a billion dollars because mm. like we consider that not to be ethical, right? And then the last piece to it is shared lifestyle or interests, which is a lot of people only have their love for each other in common. They have nothing else in common besides the fact of their attraction or their love for one another. And so they don't have activities or things that they can share and kind of collaborate over outside of that. It's like the only thing in the relationship is actually the relationship itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's like, what if you looked at them as like, would I be best friends with this person, right? Like, do I have interests and hobbies and things that I can do with them outside of just like, oh my God, I love you so much. And like, you're amazing and let's have sex. Like, I know. wonder how many viewers you're making question in their relationship right now, because I've never looked at it that way. Like the mission above all else and then values and then interest. But that makes perfect sense. It yeah. Makes very good sense, actually. I always thought that it was values at the top and then, you know, like shared interest yeah and i always, always think it's commonalities mm -hmm. at the top yeah but i feel like mission mm -hmm. that, that makes sense well you know? it depends on what kind of life you want to live too like yeah, this is just the word for me i suppose right. yeah yeah i've seen it work for a lot of people who have long lasting relationships so i would like to stay i mean like me and alex have the same thing which is like we could just be married to each other for forever we'd be super excited about that which a lot of people don't have that they're like hey i want to be married to multiple people and like this might only last 10 years and, like i'm super cool with all that i would just prefer to be married for a very long time just like seems much easier. Both of us 
the vision that we each have for ourselves is of someone who can be married for 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. And why do you want to focus on building this business so much? When is enough enough or is it just always about the growth? It's yeah, it's not about accumulation of anything. It's not about money. It's not about power or status, like none of that. It's what else am I going to do with my time? Like, I think that, and I really get it now with acquisition.com, which is you have to build a vision compelling enough that others can fit their vision inside of it and that you can fit your next vision inside of it. I only see, you know, Layla as she currently stands able to get this business to, you know, a hundred something million. I have to become a different person in order to hit a billion or to hit 10 billion or mm. 30 or 50 billion. And that is super compelling to me because I'm like, that's a challenge that I would like to figure out. That's something I would like to, and I would like to meet that person. I would like to meet Layla when she has a $10 billion company and be like, how did you do it? What did you have to go through? Like, what kind of person do you have to become? And what beliefs did you have to break in order to get there? And so for me, it's about setting a goal so big that I am forced to change and evolve in a positive way as a human in order to get there. And that other people within it also have to do the same because that's what keeps people excited. But that's just because you find personal enjoyment in that. Yeah, I like, I like proving to myself that I'm tough. What if you picked up some random hobby, let's say golfing, and you enjoyed golfing way more? Let's just say in this, <laughs> like, this is a theory, right? Let you, spike ball. Spike ball, sure. Any any sort of random thing. You loved it so much for the sake of the argument, it was golfing. Um, but, um, <laughs> or ping pong in ping your pong. case. You love ping pong way more than running your business, everything. Uh, obviously, you loved Alex, right? Um, would you stop doing your business in order to, to do ping pong if you loved it more than your business? Because love is fleeting. It's a feeling. But like logically what makes sense in order to, for me to evolve as a person is to have challenge. And that is within the business. Ping pong would not have that. But then wouldn't that mean you love the challenge more than you love ping pong? Maybe. Yeah. There's always someone know. that's better in ping pong. What? There's always someone that's better in someone ping pong. Because then I think it, for you it's a challenge. But if you were challenged and loved ping pong, assuming all else, then I think it would make sense you would follow ping pong. If I was challenged by ping pong? Yes. Yeah. And you you were loved and it challenged by ping pong. You as an but, but you made no money. <laughs> this yeah. Yeah. So because if if you're saying it's not about the money, there's gotta be a component about it that is that guess, is somewhat okay, money what, related. Here's what I, yeah. what I, where I'm not following. I don't <laughs> choose things because I love them. Yeah. Does that make sense? Why do you choose things? Because they make sense. Like logically. Like I'm like this business makes the most sense and is like the most likely vehicle to create the kind of person I want to create that I have to become to to run this business. Ping pong logically doesn't make sense. Like I don't think I will become that person through the hardships that ping pong is going to bring. <laughs> Even if I love ping pong, I also love cake. I don't eat cake all day. That makes sense. It does. It, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Do you have a strict diet that you stick to? No, I used to. I counted my okay. macros for like eleven years. Really? Because I was really fat, and so I was afraid of getting fat again. How did you? How did you get fat to begin with? Was it? Was it just something that, you know, just excessive eating, not a, exercise? I mean, I'm curious. Or <laughs> yes. some, yeah, okay. Well, it's like people are like, yeah. how'd you get fat? I'm like, I well, ate more than my body. <laughs> <laughs> I ate more calories. What kind of but question, like, man? Come on. Some of it I feel like could be hereditary. Better, some man. of it could be hereditary. I, I don't know. I'm not. Hereditary? I'm not on it. Yeah, that's kind of today with my questions. I'm really not. I feel so off. Hereditary. Yeah. I inherited their bad habits of food. It could be. Well, okay. Then, then that. Yeah, but people love that excuse. No, I mean, my family. You know, my my mother was southern. My dad was Iranian. Like probably didn't have the best food in the house but like i mean i let myself go i think you know at probably when i was like in my upper teens it was bad i just drank a ton and then would eat out and i was just being irresponsible and i think just for that period of time it was almost like we didn't get out of high school and it's like oh my god i'm free like mm -hmm. that's how i felt at least like mm -hmm. not being under the roof of my parents like finally being free i was like oh my god and then i just disregarded everything that i had been doing and kind of who i was and i that's when i gained more weight um, and I went from like, you know, having some weight to like, I was fat. Um, and when you say I, drinking, are you talking about alcohol? Oh yeah. Okay. Lots of alcohol. And that has a ton of calories. I don't yeah. know people think about that. How did you move out at 18? You don't see a lot of people just moving out at 18. Well, well unless they're going to out to college. Okay. I went, yeah, Got I went it. to college. Okay. So I went and lived in the dorms. Got it. Yeah. One thing that's kind of interesting to me is when I see people that are like exceptional in what they do, I always wonder what is the main driving factor of being this? Obviously it has to be something maybe from childhood or growing up, but you were saying when you were in college, you were okay with college, like you didn't love it or anything, but all the while you were reading Tony Robbins books, right? Yeah. And trying to like 
develop your yourself, right? Yeah. What do you think it is in your life that caused you to have this this drive to be exceptional? Is it something that like your a value your parents instilled in you? Is it just a unique thing that maybe is just like ten percent of people have it? Or what, yeah. What causes you to have this? I think where it started and where it comes from now are different. So I think where it started from was, um, you know, my parents ended up being divorced when I was like, I don't remember, eight or nine. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up living with my mother who then became an alcoholic and like went super down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, and I essentially didn't want to tell anybody because I was, I didn't, you know, it's like, it's so funny to say, cause like, I love my dad so much now and he's, we're really close, but um, I didn't know him super well back then. Like I felt like he was always at work and such. So they got divorced. I didn't want to live with him. Um, and so I was instead with my mother and I didn't want to tell anyone that she had all these issues and she would like leave me at home for long periods of time and wouldn't come back. And then she would be in the hospital. And then she would like, I remember one time she was just like passed out on the driveway and like the police came cause the neighbors called like just crazy shit like that. Right. And so I essentially had to raise myself until I was 15 when she tried to kill herself and I called the cops and they came and then they said, you can't live with her anymore. And so they took me to my dad and then he was like, what's been going on? And I was like, all of this and so i told him and so i think a lot of it was looking at her as a person and seeing like i was like how do you do that to your kid one i'm like how do you like become the mother that like becomes this like crazy alcoholic and like you know exposes your kid to all this stuff and leaves them for weeks at a time when they're young you know aren't taking care of themselves and i just wanted to be the opposite of that like i was like i will i actually remember the moment when I was sitting in the guest room of my my mother's house and she like hadn't come home for like three days and I was calling her again and I was like, fuck, is she dead? Like, and that, I always just assumed, I'm like, and one time I'm gonna call and she's just gonna be dead or something. And I hung up the phone because she didn't answer for like the 18th time and I was like, screw this. And I was like, I'm not gonna be some victim sitting here calling her, waiting for her to come home. I was like, I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna make my life fucking awesome. Like she has, because she would always tell me, she's like, well, I had a really bad childhood and all this shit. And I was like, Dude, so you and 50 million other people on this earth. And so I think looking at it, I was just like, I will not be a victim of the circumstance. I will instead allow this to be a reason why I succeed. And this will propel me to my success. And I remember thinking that and I was like, and I'm going to help other people do the same and see that circumstances should not dictate how your life turns out. And it was in that moment that I was like, I want to invest in myself. And I started looking at Tony Robbins and Nimrod and all that mm -hmm. stuff, you know, when I found them years later, but it was often a lot of not wanting to be like her. Um, and seeing and then noticing the pattern in like so many women that they didn't take care of themselves. They couldn't take care of themselves. They always relied on men. Um, I think I almost like to an extent, like had a distaste for people like that, which I don't need more, which I'm glad about. Um, but I really deeply never wanted to rely on someone else. And I never wanted to be a victim of circumstance. And I think it was just watching her just do that over and over again and seeing what it turned into her life. And I just, I felt very sad for her. And that was what put me in that direction. I no longer feel that that's what's propelling me mm -hmm. because I feel like it's like I am obviously not that. What propels me now is more of a desire to honestly just meet my future self and see what's possible. Like I think that we're all made of the same stuff, right? And so it's like I can literally do, I, I truly believe, I'm like I could do anything that anyone else on earth has done. And I think that's really freaking cool. And so now it's more of a desire to see what that looks like and to meet the person that I have to become in 20 or 30 years when I put myself in situations where there's more pressure to become that kind of person. So I like putting myself in a business and setting very high goals because there's external circumstance that is forcing internal change. In order to make this successful, make the external successful, the business, I have to become a different person. And I like that because I think that's constant challenge. And so I think it, it shifted over time. I think when I was probably around like 19 or 20, I went from not wanting to be like her or be like anyone like that to wanting something more, probably because I think I, I went through a lot of like dealing with it around that age because mm -hmm. I was very angry for a long time. Like I was just angry about the situation and I changed my mindset around it. And I was like, I am so, and I really like, I am deeply thankful for this situation. I am deeply thankful that that happened because I think I would have been so soft had that not happened. Like my, my parents were very protective of me as a kid. And until they got divorced and I was in that situation with her, I think that they probably would have continued to be very protective of me. And I don't know if I would have learned how to lead myself, learned how to manage myself, learned how to manage my emotions, had I not been exposed to it young. And I think getting exposed to it young um, was a huge advantage for me because a lot of people are like, how old are you? And like, how have you achieved? I'm like, I think I started being able to parent myself and manage myself at a very young age. And so it's, it's helped me now. That's interesting. So basically it was a, 
a slow decline and then you apparently had to hit this rock bottom moment in order to flip that light switch and change, I guess, your, I don't know, the way that you felt about success in your own life. Yeah, I think I just realized that, you know, I forgave her um, for everything that it went through. I mean, I just look at it from a very unbiased point of view. I'm like, she's just a human. And like so many people on this earth have so many issues and mm -hmm. they don't know how to deal with them. And she was not equipped with those tools and she didn't have access to some of the things I have access to now. So she never dealt with that stuff. And she's just, I don't know, chosen to never do anything about it now. So I don't know. I think it was just like dealing with that and being like, I'm okay with that. And I'm actually like really glad because I realized probably around that age, I was like, all of what I got to see showed me so much about what I did want because I knew what I didn't want. I was like, I definitely don't want that. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what I do want looks more like this. And then over time it became a lot less of, I don't want that and more just, this is what I do want. I've seen that a lot mm. where people, they grow up in an environment and like they, they see their parents' life and they're like, I do not want that for myself. And that's a really powerful motivator. Yeah. is to not be like someone also in the same way of like being like someone or being better than mm -hmm. someone not being like someone's also extremely powerful yeah absolutely do you want kids not right now okay no um i think that a lot of women want children when they don't feel fulfilled by other areas of their life and typically that's like in your young 20s you're not fulfilled yet you haven't figured out what you wanted um and typically you know men are more apt to like have pursued their career earlier. I started pursuing my career fairly early. And so the opportunity for me to really feel a gap where a children would fill it, it just like never occurred. And so I think um, I would love if I had a kid with Alex. Like, I think the one thing is like, oh, I would love to have a kid with him specifically, mm -hmm. right? Like us have like a little shared thing. It's like, well, it's half of you and half of you. It's so cute, right? <laughs> like very cute. I don't think I would enjoy the day-to-day -day as much as I enjoy the day-to-day -day of what I do now without kids. Mm -hmm. So one thing Alex mentioned about having a kid uh -huh. is that he says it could be a selfish thing to have a kid because a lot of people are selfish insofar as like they want to see their kid they want to see that kid is me that kid is a representation of me and i like me so i love my kid mm -hmm. what do you think about that i agree with him really mm -hmm. what do you think explain it, it it's selfish he just says to, like yeah it's it's usually motivated by being selfish because like uh, people, he says people can oftentimes be inherently selfish, like some people, a lot of people. Uh, and that's like the motivation of having a kid. You like could you argue yourself. both ways. I feel like you could say that's one of the most unselfish things because then you put your child before you or you would, you would hope that would be the case. Yeah. But then you dedicate, you know, so much of your, like you could be spending your time doing anything else, but now you're taking care of another person, like raising another person. That person becomes a priority. I think it could go either way, but it could be done initially out of selfish, selfish reasons of I, maybe, maybe you're unfulfilled or uh, maybe yeah. it's something to replace. Like, you know, I don't feel purpose, but now with a child, I feel purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it could go both ways. I feel. I think most people have a kid to give themselves purpose and then they put a lot of pressure onto the child to fulfill the purpose that they've desired. Mm -hmm. And so that kid has all this pressure on them from a parent that's not warranted. And the kid never wanted that pressure, right? But it's what the parent has wanted from the kid. And so I think a lot of times they try to project, it's almost like using it as like a projection of oneself. And so I think in those situations, it doesn't make sense to have a kid. And I mean, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I mean, I would like my, I'm not yet enough of a realized person to want to have a kid and be like, I'm okay if Johnny hates me and is unsuccessful. Because here's the thing, he could hate you and be an unsuccessful person. You could have a kid and they could be a piece of shit and they could hate you and like never do anything with their lives. And you have to be okay with that. I was in a room with Tony Robbins just like a month ago and he literally talked about this. He's like, dude, you have gotta be okay with the fact that if you have a kid, he was talking to some woman. Mm -hmm. He's like that that kid might not be successful at all and might not like you. Do you still wanna have a kid? That's worst case scenario. Wow. Can you live with the worst case scenario? That is worst case scenario. That's exactly what Alex said. Alex, well, this is what Alex said. He says, mm -hmm. Uh, he would have a hard time saying that he wants them to be their own person. He would want them to be who he wants them to be. Yeah, he would. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree say with the same thing. I mean, really? I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd have a very, it would obviously I mean, yeah. hurt as a parent. It's like, you try so hard to like raise your kid to be moral or ethical. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like, I'm not going to say anything, but doing bad stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm so worried like, with the kids tend to rebel. And if like I'm so focused on like, you know, hey, improving yourself and making money and growing and like, you know, fulfilling your passion. And they're like, ah, that's stupid because dad does it. I'm just going to go smoke weed. And like, that's all they do. I'd be so upset. 
I just feel <laughs> like the best parenting strategy is leading by example. Like, obviously there are some times where you're going to have to step in, you know, tell your kid, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But for the most part, like, I feel like people are moral and they know when they did something wrong for the most part. And if you're always just a good person, your kid will see that they'll respect it. You know what I mean? Will they? Yeah. Because kids will always be betrayed by their friends. There will always be an ebb and flow to relationships with their peers. Right. But if you can be this fatherly figure that the kid can always look up to and be like, there is no ebb and flow to my dad. He's always been good to me. He always loves me. He always supports me in all of my actions. And you just live your own life and lead by example. There's no ebb and flow to that. They're a constant. Yeah. I don't, I don't agree. I think it just depends on the kid. I mean, I've seen the same, but then humans have this natural proclivity to rebel. And so it's like if you set the standard, even if you're not trying to coerce someone into an action, they know when you're trying to influence them. And humans naturally rebel when they think that they're under influence, which is why so many kids rebel against their parents. There's lots of studies on this. So I think it depends on the intelligence level of the kid. Like I could look at my parents when I was a kid and be like, my dad does this. That's good. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think some kids, 100 percent, that is. And let's be real. It's better to lead by example than not. Yes. It's just that when they're of a certain age, when they're very like they're very drawn to that rebellion stage. That they just do the opposite. But right? the thing is, so it like, usually is like an echo chamber. For example, your kid rebels and then you get mad at your kid and the kid's like, oh, well, this is the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to get mad at me. Like, that's pretty bad, but I can deal with that instead of like just I feel like letting it kind of happen as long as it's not like outside of what you deem OK. Mm -hmm. And then obviously being upset by it, but like not like shunning your kid and like pointing fingers and stuff like that. You yeah. Know? Well, that's not, I think most people don't understand how to use punishment and that punishment actually is not useful most of the time. Why do you think punishment's not useful? Because what is punishment actually doing? Like, are they learning anything from, if the goal is that they don't do this thing again, then now what you're teaching them is that you get this, this bad thing happens when you've done a bad thing, but you're not teaching them how to be better. You're not helping them realize for themselves mm -hmm. why they could do something differently the next time. And it's not autonomous either. It's you are an external person, you know, inflicting a punishment upon them versus like them deciding for themselves that it's not a good idea. So I feel like it just takes away a lot of autonomy. It's kind of like if an employee makes a mistake in my business, am I gonna yell at them and be like, you did not do a good job and because of this, you're getting taken away? And I'm like, no, I am also a human who makes mistakes. I do not do that. Uh, I put Jack in timeout so many times. Yeah, <laughs> Like Jack, no, okay. I, yeah, I hated it. Yeah. Part of me though feels like as a child within like a certain range of activities that they could be doing, it's like putting on a timeout or something negative moves them away from that pain. And so they're like, well, if I don't scream at the restaurant, I, I don't have to go and sit by myself for 30 minutes with nothing to do. And so then you could learn social cues by like, I don't want to be in timeouts. So I'm not going to do that long enough for you to like recognize that that's not something to do. I agree to an extent. It's just that most children then find a way to just avoid the punishment. So they'll just figure out a way to do it without you finding out as the parent. So they're not taught to not do the thing. They're taught to know now if I do the thing, I get punished. And now I have to figure out how to avoid that punishment. Maybe. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I, I can't say. Yeah. Layla. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I have a very, very similar viewpoint. And um, when I grew up and I went to school, I went to, to two completely opposite schools. One was in a, you know, very impoverished area and was one was very wealthy. And I learned that at this wealthy school, um, a lot of the kids have great examples for parents, right? They have parents that had successful careers. Uh, half the time, you know, it's like a, a whole family or whatever you want to call it. And I noticed that those kids... Um, would rebel probably more than, 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 than the ones over here. And, um, I think that just because if you lead by example, doesn't mean that your kid will want that. I think they're going to want what they want. Well, there's and, a difference yeah. between leading by example and en enabling. Cause I know that's a pretty big stereotype is like, if you're a wealthy parent, you kind of enable your kid to do these bad things. Cause you can always get them out of trouble. And I think that is also kind of like, it's like the opposite of punishment, right? Enabling. Kinda. It's like they're both the, the extremes on the spectrum. Alex made a reference about the two types of relationships that in his mind he thinks work. So one is the we are in this together relationship where two people are, you know, split partners, split responsibilities. He said so that's what you and him are. Um, and then the other one is the cheerleader and the quarterback with the cheerleader cheering on the quarterback. And um, that's not as successful of a dynamic as we are in this together. What do you think about that? Are those the two real only dynamics that you think will work? And do you agree that we are in this together is the most powerful dynamic for a successful relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, there's a study that's been done that basically talks about the three dynamics of relationship and who's the happiest versus who's the most successful versus who's not, right? 
So the most successful and the ones that make the most money are the ones that have our dynamic, where it's two people that share the power that are in the same vehicle together that are driving towards something, right? So they have a shared career, uh, they're in it together and they split it and it's equal power, right? They make the most money, but they're not the most content. They're happy, but they're not the most content. The most content are actually people who, they each have their own individual career, which is similar, but separate, right? Um, but they're both like leading the way in those careers. And then the last one are the people who are the most content, but make, make the least amount of money and impact, which is uh, one person is the dominating force and the other person is like the assistant or supporter. Um, more content for sure, uh, less money and impact. So there's a study done, Esther Perel broke it down, basically talked about those three. Mm. So I think what he was pointing out is basically just like, there's a couple things, which is like, that's what we see most commonly. And this is like speaking in generalization. So yeah. like, I see those tend to work best also because it's clarity of roles, right? Like it's really clear that either you're in this together or it's like one person's doing it and the other one's following. And I think a lot of people, if you go outside of that, then you have to define it for yourself. So I'd say other forms of relationships could absolutely be successful. It's just that most people don't clarify it. Like most people don't clarify what our relationship is. What are the rules of this relationship game? And if we're not picking one that's off the shelf, what's it gonna be? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't take the time to decide like, are you a want match for me? Like is what I want and what you want, are they the same thing? And are we gonna write it down and make it very clear? Cause I think that's where most people go wrong. And that's why it's in both those scenarios, it's so well defined that it's yeah. almost, it's hard to argue. That makes sense. Yeah. So I do think that that is probably I, I agree with what he's saying we talk about it a lot because we're like we also recognize that like our relationship is not like most and it's i think it's honestly just a unique situation in which like we met under weird circumstances we're both kind of odd people and like have different you know things that we're like interested in um and we just work and i don't think that our relationship advice should apply to everybody like at all in fact i, apply, I think it applies to less people it's like if you put two people in the same room think about this right like if you go on a deserted island with somebody it's like, and you're stuck there for like a month. You most likely will love that person at the end of that month, whether you want to or not, whether you even like them or not, you may love them mm -hmm. because it's almost like a feeling of comfort. And so I think that it's, it's just reminding ourselves like feelings are always gonna be fleeting. If we have a good argument and a good foundation for the marriage that's logical, then it's more likely to last in the long run. And so it's also, I guess, you know, it'd be like, what is your goal? Some people don't care about being married forever or like for the rest of their lives. And like a lot of people don't. I know a lot of people are like, Layla, I don't jive with that. And so I'm also speaking in terms of like, if you want to be married for a long time, I've done a lot of research on that. I've read a lot about it. And I feel pretty strongly that, that I'm going to be right. Hmm. Do you have any dating advice for Jack? Are you dating? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to be dating. Yeah. What's that mean? How are you trying? Because I'm not really like, like I feel like in order to qualify as dating, you probably need to be going on dates. Okay. Then you're trying to go on dates, but you're not. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm like <laughs> trying super hard to go on dates, but if the opportunity is presented, you know, then I would probably go on a date. Yeah. That's going to be hard. You're going to be waiting a long time. Yeah. I think realistically, I just need more urgency with it. You know, how old I, are you? 23. Oh, you're young. Yeah. I need to be more motivated. I that think was that's when I met Alex. I was 23. Really? Mm -hmm. All right, I gotta get on it. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have a mission. Like, would you, would you do well, I'm online on all dating? Of them, but I don't really spend much time on them, to be honest. Like I, I, like I said, there's an ebb and flow to my motivation with dating. Sometimes mm -hmm. I really want a girlfriend. Sometimes I don't. I, I figure if there is an ebb and flow like that, probably means it's not the right time. So I think that's normal, actually. Okay, maybe it is perfect. Maybe it's the perfect mm -hmm. time. <laughs> I mean, there's totally times when you're gonna be in a relationship and you're gonna be like, I could be totally fine being single. Yeah. Yeah. That's Me and Alex actually talk about that. We're like, yeah, if you died, I don't know if I'd get remarried. You probably would, right? No. You wouldn't? Dude, that's like, I feel like I'm like the worst, like, I would have a lot of money and like run this big business and like have had a husband that I like ran it with who then, you know, died. It's like, who's my candidate pool? Like younger guys, like I feel like a lot of men don't like the fact that I want all these things for myself and I have these ambitions. Or I find someone who's like a complete beta and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll like fly on your private jet and take all your money and do all that, which I wouldn't marry that person yeah. because I would definitely not want them to take all my money. So it's like, what purpose does marriage serve? It's like, it's like I don't know if it would serve a purpose at that point. You could always have a life partner, someone that you're life. with, you know, without exactly. Without I don't know if I would yeah. get married legally sure. to that person. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, because at that point, I just feel like, and then I don't know. I mean, Alex is always like, it was fucked built together. Yeah. What? It wasn't built together. If you get a new person, right? Yeah, it wasn't built together, and I. And then at a certain point, you're like, because I think the reason that people get, mar get married changes, right? It's like a lot of people get married 
to have kids together and start a family. There's always like a purpose behind it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think some people get married, you know, we got married because we wanted to build this life together, right? And so it's like, if I have built the life that I've wanted and say I don't have kids and don't want kids, and then I'm 45 and, you know, Alex is no longer there, why would I get married? And it would probably yeah. be if I wanted to start some kind of new life or new something with somebody. But if I'm content in my own, then yeah, I don't know why I'd get married. That makes sense. There is a possibility. You seem very set in your ways, like about how you are so excited to meet your future self, right? There is a chance that one day you wake up and all of your, your desires from that just completely change into something like, I want to live on a ranch in Montana. There's a chance, right? Yeah. And so what if the right guy comes along, you know, he's your plumber, he's fixing your pipes. You're assuming and, Alex uh, is dead. Yeah. Assuming <laughs> pretty Gosh. dismal conversation, but there's a chance something like that could happen, right? There's a yeah. Do you think there's a chance that one day you can just wake this up is, and not want to? It's a weird, a lot of assumptions have to happen there, Jack. <laughs> yeah. so Alex is listening and he's like, what the fuck, well, Like Jack? if this happens, All but right. that happens, right, and then Alex, over here. My bad, man. Jack, Jack is basically this I'll, say, I'll say this, I'll say this oh to your God. point, which is I think if I look at like who I was when I was even two years old versus who I am now, I think there's always been an inherent like, I've always been someone who's pursued challenges in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't plan on stopping and maybe I do wake up and one day, you know, I mean, that's the thing though, is like there's plenty of days I feel like doing that, that I'm like, hey, we could just retire and get a ranch and do it. Like, of course there's days where that sounds like more incentivizing. I just never have given into that feeling. Mm. So I would have to change a lot as a human in order to do that. I don't feel like it. I'm not going on some ayahuasca trip anytime soon, which mm -hmm. is one I've seen a lot of people, you know, they do yeah. some weird thing like that and then they're like, boop, other way. Yeah. Um, so what, do you, yeah, what are your thoughts on like psychedelics and ayahuasca? Have you, have you tried any of that? I'm no. just curious, no? No, I've done a lot of drugs like in my past, but yeah. like not like, the hippie drugs, like hard drugs. Okay. Um, I don't even know how to define the those, drug, but, yeah. but I feel like there's a difference. Of hard drugs? Yeah, I, I mean. Like that's like the, oh, like the, you know. I, I haven't done like yeah. meth or anything, but I mean like. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, well, let's, be let's be clear. <laughs> I, I didn't say During my partying yeah. phase, like I try, I was like, sure, I'll try something. Like I was just super irresponsible. I didn't yeah. think about consequences. Um, yeah. But I've not, like, since that phase, I haven't done drugs <laughs> just because. What? I'm thinking, are you thinking what I'm thinking? What? The, I'm the meth. <laughs> the, the meth comments. What? We had a guy on the podcast a long time ago. Oh, uh, who come was a on, for man. former addict. Oh. And he talked about meth. And Jack's question was, how do you do it? <laughs> this was early on in and the podcast. Like, you know, Jack, like, you don't ask that. I and ask I'm what like, my brain wants me to ask. That, that's like if you have an alcoholic and you're like, yeah. what was your favorite drink? Can you just no, yeah. it, it was Jake. It was Jake. It was Jake. What Jake, I did Jake, was yeah. I read the room and he said he was comfortable he talking was, about whatever. He was comfortable. And I really had no idea. You know, it was an itch. I, I wanted to scratch it. So I asked the question. I actually love that. That's right? a great question. It's like, what do you do? <laughs> right? I don't yeah. want to say certain ways to that. I think I, it can be done, but I, what do you do? I, it, I mean, I asked, we, was, we met a guy and he was like, I have two wives. And I was like, tell me how that works. Like, you know. Yeah. Like, well, see? What if what, two of you, do you just have sex in front of the other person on your bed? Like, what yeah, do you do? He was watch? super happy to tell me. And I was like, interesting. It's just satisfying that random, you know, little cur curiosity. See, I just think you could have Googled that. Like that wasn't. I want to know how he for... specifically did it, man. Him. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to know. You know. <laughs> oh my god. Did Beautiful. he describe it? I don't think he did. No, because you wouldn't let him. I didn't think it was appropriate for the podcast. Mm. To describe how this guy. Well, is, you know, that's you a know. that's a good point. That's yeah, because yeah, you don't want to like. People yeah. Be like, oh, I'm gonna go try. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we don't want to teach people how to. <laughs> no. Do you guys do psychedelics? <laughs> no. Okay. I've I've never done anything. I I'll incriminate myself here. I've I've tried weed like three times in my entire life, and that was it. And I hated it every single time. The first time I was sixteen, and I was hanging out like, like in the band group, and all of them were stoners. Yeah. And so I would see them doing it. I was like, I was just curious. I'm like, what what's appealing about this? I never had any desires. So I'm, like, I'm gonna try it, and hated it instantaneously like i didn't like that feeling of not being in control i, I felt paranoid i was like I, I thought the police were going to show up and just like arrest all of us i hated it but then they're like no you got you gotta do it again because like the first time is never good like the second time i tried again say it was I hated it just as much and i think there was a third time years later where i was like eh, it, maybe i hated it there's not uh, one point i ever enjoyed it so yeah. no that was my only ever experience okay yeah, I'm not really like a proponent. I think most people are like, oh, it opens up my brain. It makes me smarter. And I'm like, it literally turns off part of your brain. I don't really think that makes you smarter. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't, 
think like if you really study what they do, they yeah. turn off different parts of the brains and then people are like, I can make better decisions. I'm like, can you though? I don't. I yeah. wouldn't the argument is that with certain parts of your brain shut off, you can kind of isolate your focus to other parts of your brain and it kind of simplifies things. Yeah. Do I necessarily agree that like it's a good strategy to find clarity? No, but can it be used as a tool to find clarity? Probably. Yeah, I've always been curious about like being able to tap into different senses of like creativity or different thoughts that you would never have otherwise. But then it's like I would never want to like alter myself in such a way where you would rely on that or maybe no. like that's the only way you could tap into that. And I, I've been so terrified of doing anything because I'm like if I if I like it, it would be hard for me not to justify continuing. So it's probably best. I just don't. I mean, I think that's a really sound strategy. That's basically how I operate, which is like, I would probably like it. And so I do not want to try it. Like I tried things in my past and I liked them. And I was like, I do not want to try it. Like you try like, and even like stuff like Adderall. I'm like, oh my God, I really like Adderall. Not doing that again. You know, like mm -hmm. it's just, it just don't want to even risk it. Yeah. I think for me, I limit it just to coffee. Like yeah. coffee's coffee the perfect is, balance. It, it is addictive. It's quite It addictive. is incredibly and addictive. And you kind of rely on it now, Yeah. Right? I couldn't go a what's, day without what's the a problem cup of coffee. Now? How much do you drink? Uh, usually two cups of coffee, That's which it's bad. it's not bad, That's but conservative, Graham. Come on. it's not. I how <laughs> how many cups of coffee do you see around the house that are half finished? Is that coffee? I see no. This way is not. too many to be two cups a day, man. No, because I don't pick up the glasses. That could be glass from like days ago. That's a different problem, man. If you're like. I what leaving glass? It's, yeah. So sometimes I'll just I'll have a coffee like this. We picked three glasses from the the podcast. I'm gonna just leave it, and so, then then it gets watered down. I two cups like of coffee. Is I like how much? Is right. So now that two you, cups. That you it's rely, not three. I know 100 percent it's not three. Now that you it's rely not. on coffee, right? Yeah. How bad is it that you drink it every day? If you could find something else that was as inconvenient to drink as coffee, but it was it had the amount of upside that coffee does. It was just another random thing. Let's just say. Terrible example, smoking a cigarette, okay? But there wasn't really like the health detriment of smoking it. Would you step outside and smoke a couple cigarettes per day if you got what? the same amount of benefit of coffee? No, no probably detriment. not. No, for me, so? for me, the coffee is like, I really enjoy the taste. <laughs> I like sipping on something. I like a cold drink and I never drink warm coffee. It's about yeah. having a, like a cold drink over ice. But something what if about you enjoy the taste of menthol? <laughs> <laughs> what if I enjoyed no, anything else? Coffee, I mean, what does like, that have to do with menthol? Do you guys think coffee's bad? I don't think coffee's bad. I think that the logic you're using is a touch flawed, you know? You, <laughs> two cups a day, Jack. We get Macy in here. She'll tell me. Okay, that, that's two not cups. the, the, the point cups. here. But, right. you know, the, the coffee consumption, you rely on it every single I do, day. I do rely on it. Right. And if you I weren't do. to have, if you, if you wouldn't have it, right, wouldn't you feel poorly? Correct. Yeah, but yeah. If you, here's the thing. I've gone off coffee multiple times. You feel like shit for like a few days and then you're fine. Yeah. But no, like, the, it's better when you have it. Yeah, sure. yeah. I've, the last time, I think it was like 2018, it was like five years ago, that I, I stopped drinking coffee for like a month and I found myself, I was less happy. I was not motivated and I made less money. And like immediately when that happened, I was like, let me just drink coffee. Like the it's happy not and worth motivated it. Parts not you know it's, it's no big deal. But the money part. The money. Like, yeah. Okay, let's get back but no, I just I lost that sense of enjoyment. It was weird. Like the first two weeks sucked, and that was like I was just going to bed early and just you know tired, groggy in the morning. But after like three weeks, it kind of wore off. I kind of my my mood mm -hmm. and my energy was about the same. But I just lacked that like something to look forward to. And for me, it was just like I looked forward to just having that cup of coffee. I don't know what it Why'd is. Why'd you take okay. a month off? Uh, I wanted to see if I could do it and I read something online or I watched a YouTube video about being addicted to caffeine and uh, maybe it was like ASAP science or something of, of your body on caffeine. They mentioned that there's like 20 days or something like that, that your body gets rid of it. And like, because you built up such a tolerance to it, I just figured it's probably a healthy thing to do. Mm. I mean, but, people that they've done studies on this, it's like one cup of coffee a day. Those people live longer and are happier on average yeah but they now, say that, that about the cause or correlation uh, i don't know yeah but like i think it's dosage like most things like did you know if you smoke a cigarette three times a week it doesn't really do shit like people don't talk about that they're not like you can only smoke three weeks and stuff They're like smoking is so bad for you but like if you smoked three a week you most likely would never have anything yeah happen. but don't you think if you smoked three a week that it would be very easy to for that person to want four the habit or then yeah bad. correct sure but if you have self-control or discipline if you're somebody that can actually do that which i know people who are like they'll smoke a cigarette once a week or every two weeks or whatever yeah. and you know that they, they know all these things um they're like that's not bad but it's it's the habit that gets people into it so yeah. you can't stop
I mean, it's like anything in life, right? If we have too much of it, it's probably not going to yeah. be good. I watched a good video uh, from Yes Theory where they visited the country that lives the longest. And for them, it was wine. Mm. And they would be drinking a lot of wine. It was like two to three glasses a day of wine. But it seemed to be more of the lifestyle that it's a lot of socializing. And a lot of just like a community aspect right. within a small town. And they're all like drinking wine together. And it seems like that's probably better for you than the wine itself. I would think so. The communal aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, like America doesn't have much of that at all. No. Yes, oh, and their work schedule, I think, was uh, like three days or four days. Like they had a much different schedule. I forget where this was. It was a really good video. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah there was another channel that uh, got recommended. That's, what is it? Sky Life, where she interviewed some of the oldest living people and tried to figure out their, their secrets. And a lot of it was having purpose, work. Uh, but for them, it was um, their church yeah. and like staying alive long enough to you know spread the gospel and and network with other people not network it's a <laughs> network but but have that supportive community where they're all like aligned together and and oh you know what it was it was uh part of the religion was very much about like no caffeine no drinking no smoking uh all natural foods and i think that really fed into it hmm. who knows that's the thing yeah is there anything you wanted to bring up or talk about here i was going to ask yeah. you guys what your goals are right now that was my next question. Just like, what's the goal in terms of like with iced coffee hour versus the, you know, the main channel? Like, what are you guys focused on right now? Uh, out of main channel for me is always like the top of the, the <laughs> top of the totem pole. It's about to say pyramid. pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> top of the pyramid. <laughs> I can't, you can't say pyramid anymore without no. making it sound yeah, like a scam. Really a scam. I, I've basically just gotten to a point where I really feel like I should be diversifying and trying different things and not just having you know, the, the main channel, which has basically been my core for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I know that I cannot sustain three videos a week indefinitely. There's got to be a point where eventually I'm going to scale down to two. Maybe there's going to be one. Um, or maybe it just, you know, just five years from now, I'm like, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to continue uh, making those videos. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But I want to have other things that I could do in conjunction with that main channel. Um, so it started off as a second channel, which was the reaction videos. We've done the iced coffee hour, which I believe has probably the most longevity from anything. Because uh, it's interview but, style. Right. But yeah. then it's like you don't want to just be, uh, you know, on camera all the time. And I felt like creator properties would be a great way where I could continue focusing on all the other channels, yeah. which are my priority right now, while still investing and in getting back to the roots of real estate. What is Creator Properties? So it's a syndication where we could team okay. up with other accredited investors and buy a property that is significantly bigger than I would be able to do on my own. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Pineda has such a tight team that's able to handle all of the day to day. And so that's where the benefit really came in the sense that, you know, I could invest my money into this and get exposure to deals that I wouldn't have done on my own. Because I just, I wouldn't have the time to find them. I wouldn't have the time to manage them. So much work that goes uh, on behind the scenes in terms of like fixing yeah. up and remodeling. I couldn't do that. And it's, it's, it would pull time away from everything else that I'm doing. So you put your money in there and then how do you find the other people to, you know, uh, put capital in? Just our own network. Um, okay. Whether that be just putting a link in the description. I've, I've talked about it every now and then. Ryan talked about it when he was on the podcast. Uh, I found so far that usually just placing a link in the description. I, I don't yeah. like to be too pitchy. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm always afraid like, Hey guys, you know, go and sign up and it, Oh, you know, it's expiring in 30 days and you got to do it now. Like, I, I just don't feel good about that. Um, so I, usually I like it's just, I, I feel better just putting a link in the description. I'll casually mention it. And that's, and that's it. And I feel like the people who are interested are more likely to do that anyway than yeah. like having it forced. So What's the typical, you know, what's the minimum that someone has to put into one of those deals? It depends on the deal. Uh, it's going to be between probably twenty five and seventy five thousand dollars. Oh shit, it's low. Yeah. Well, that makes sense too because I was thinking like for your channel, like if it's like five hundred grand or something. I'm like, no, how many people no. Do yeah, yeah, okay. No, um, yeah, the first deal uh, was twenty five, and I think going forward it's going to be higher. Um, but a lot of the other ones that I've heard, uh, mm -hmm. some of the biggest ones are. Uh, 250 to 350 grand. Yeah. And like, they won't take anyone lower than that. And that's like the standard they've set mm -hmm. and, uh, they get it. Yeah. So I think for this first one, we really just wanted to test a proof of concept and we felt like, you know, 25 was an appropriate amount. Yeah. 
That makes sense. As long as it's to somebody that 25 is not much money, it's not hard to do that. It's not yeah. like a lot of pressure on you guys. Right. That's interesting. So do you want to do more things like that? Is that what the goal is? I think the goal is to get, to do that in conjunction with everything else. I mean, right now my goal is just c to continue focusing on main second podcast channels. Have you guys thought about creating your own product? I'm not a product person. I mean, I, I've wasted so much just energy and mental thoughts on like, oh, I should be doing this. And, you know, when Alex was here, he got me thinking like, oh man, what am I doing? My strength and my enjoyment comes from making videos. And so right now that should be my focus. I think anything else, I'm not that person. I'm, I love just getting down, planning out a video, scripting, filming, title thumbnail like that that's what i like doing and that's i think I my agree. strength yeah i think you should do that yeah. i guess i just like from my perspective right like like there's so many people that just want to work with somebody like you and mm -hmm. build the business below it and yeah. like not bother you with any of it but they could i don't know i i i, I get my fingers in everything it, it's hard oh, so for me to resist? no it's, okay. it's really hard for me to take a, a backseat approach and just let someone else handle it it's really difficult Fair. um if I see something, I'm like, no, it should be done this way. And I, I, I get too, you know, Eek. nitpicky with things. So I've kind of realized that limitation is just. Yeah. Yeah. And you attaching definitely. my name to anything, I would be a perfectionist in that. Knowing that if something goes bad, then I would obsess over how could I fix that. That would be hard to scale something then. Yeah. Sure. That makes so, sense then. Yeah. Main focus is just the iced coffee hour. For sure. And growing and having the best possible guests on, talking about the coolest possible stuff and, I don't know, making the best content. Do That's you see something that Graham doesn't see in terms of like where there's potential for the business? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, certainly. I'm... I, I'm like very much so like, hey, let's keep like trying out new things, uh, like hiring on more people, building, building, building. And Graham is very much like what we're doing right now is working. Let's just continue doing it. And if we continue doing that, we'll continue moving up. So, but I like, I'm, I think maybe I'm a little bit more risky, you know, mm. and uh, I want to try out more things that maybe are a little bit more exhausting, such as potentially hiring someone and, you know, doing stuff like that. But Interesting. I think both are needed though. So that's a good yeah. balance. Yeah. It's just like. Most of the time, what you do is needed. And then every once in a while, we need a new idea. So it's like, how can you, in a safe environment, continue to test ideas that's like low risk, low capital. And then when one does work, then you're like, I like that too. Then you can yeah. actually do it. I think for me on the iced coffee hour, the biggest thing is how can we break out of our, I don't want to call it a rut, but right now, our, the, the guests that we have on is within our sphere of influence. And it's people that we know or, or people that we've reached out to or get back to us or who want to come on. Uh, there's plenty of people like that, but we want to get into just musicians, actors, uh, people that we would never ordinarily come in contact with through the YouTube space. Mm. And we're having a hard time doing that because we look at, let's say, podcasts like uh, Nelk or Impulsive. Mm -hmm. And they're getting some of these people like, How? I, I can't believe it. Like Nelk got the president on or, or the former president, Trump. Um, and like, I'm not expecting that we would get a you know president on, but some of the people that they're on, I'm like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? That's incredible. Um, and I think we need to break into that. Do you know those people like of the podcast impulsive? Could you talk yes. to them? Uh, no, I mean, I, I watch their podcast. I watch okay. almost every single one of them. Yeah. Cause I feel like the fastest way is actually not to go figure out how to get the influencers or like the celebrities or the musicians or any of that stuff. It'd be to go to the people that have those podcasts and say, how do you get these people on your show? They literally just DM them. I mean, Logan Paul has 20 million followers yeah. on Instagram. So it's like he DMs anybody they see it. That he's those Interesting. Top, so. Right. Yeah. So if you tried DMing, they just don't respond. Yeah, we we would send out. I mean, <laughs> Jack's like, Jack, Jack was like, DM Celine Dion. Okay, on, DM Bruno Mars. No, like, Jack, okay, you're never yeah. going to get so back to us. What we used to do is we'd go Madonna. on these walks and we'd come up with a list of like 20 possible people we could bring on the podcast then co you know create a copy paste should i say copy paste no uh, it, it, it wasn't touch. quite a template but yeah. i would go through and personalize every single one of them okay. yeah and we would send this out to those 20 people that we created the list of and then i did it one recently i thought it was funny because i looked up you know mainstream celebrities in las vegas <laughs> and sure celine dion was on the list and sure bruno mars was on the list but if you don't shoot you can't make it you yeah know? The thing I think with a lot of those people is that they have large PR teams that they just can't come on and talk candidly on a podcast yeah. without a lot of review and approval ahead of time. Because anything they say could reflect on so many different avenues. As that, soon as you yeah. land one, though, 
yeah. then you can use that to land because I've, I've actually encountered this several times where people are like, all right, show me the best episodes you've had or the coolest people you've had on. And I've had to like send this out to people for trying to get someone on. Um, so that's very common. Yeah. I know like Steve Aoki lives here and mm -hmm. like, you know, what's going on uh, with that, man. What, I've, I've told you to text him. I know. Oh, I so feel like I know, I know multiple yeah. people who are like friends with him here. I'm like, I feel like he would come on. Uh, yeah. There were, and, yeah. There, there was a point where, uh, it was like, you know, COVID time and, and, didn't feel comfortable with, uh, you know, coming on at that Understood. point. Yeah, with everything he was doing. So, uh, yeah, I got to reach back out. Yeah, you should reach back out. I yeah. feel like that's a great one. Yeah. Great Especially one. because I don't think people know that he's, like, such a great business he is. person. Yeah. And they're just like, oh, Steve, okay, the DJ. I'm like, no, dude, he's, like, a savage. Oh, yeah. That's sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. Yeah, I think he's just breaking into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was actually doing some thinking. I think it would be a smart idea We hire a podcast producer for three months. I really like Let's that go. idea. I love it. For three, I think it's a great but idea. But just three months. Yeah. And if we don't see a benefit in three months, that's the end of it. I agree. And there's 100%. 90 Let's days. They have 90 Super days. Super down. You should love just totally, okay. like, if you're ever trying to, like, hire somebody and it's like, a, just bring someone as a contractor. Say it's a project basis and we'll reevaluate in 90 days. Yeah. Part of part of the thing for me is that I feel like I've done everything myself and I'm like, we could just do it. We, we have four people between us and Andrew Four people. There's no reason why we can't accomplish that. Mm -hmm. But well, not everyone's you though. Yeah, but I feel like everyone has the time. No, like this, you, is, this is the fallacy yeah. that most founders like you have when you're like a very capable person is you think that it takes everyone else the same time it takes you, and that's the reason a lot of businesses can't grow. Is people are like, well, I'm not going to hire someone because like just, Sally can do that for two. They don't have the attention. Yeah. Most people don't have the attention to do what you do and have that much dedicated. Like most people have so many other things going on in their lives. I mean, to get myself out of the business, it's probably like five to six roles that need to get hired that are mm -hmm. high level people that are paid like you know between 200 and 500 grand a year each to get alex out of the business it's usually like you know eight to ten people to get him out to yeah. like build a whole marketing department basically so it's like it just never you're never going to find like one person who's going to be able to do it as well as you in most yeah. if it's something you're good at okay if it's something you're bad at you'll for sure find people that are better than you at it because you're like okay. oh, i don't think that we're particularly good at reaching out to guests because that's something that lies in your court of like the you're responsibilities right. of this podcast you're right. and i would say honestly that's one of the things that we need the most amount of why you're would right. you be the you're one right. reaching out to i would get someone i would pay them a commission based on the guests that they're going to get so yeah. you basically have like an a list b list c list guest and they get paid a commission based on the kind of guests that they bring on to the show that's ex I literally said that exact thing to you. I said the Did exact you? thing. Yep. You mentioned the commission. And you I never said, said A, B, and C. Though. Yes, I, no, I, I literally said they bring on this tier, yeah. we pay them X amount. They bring on this tier, we pay them X amount. I, I don't literally remember said that. that. I don't remember. 100%. I just I don't feel like if you have someone yeah. full time doing that, that's going to get you out of the rut. I 100% right. agree. No, I, think like that is, I think that is the main reason we need a producer is for guest outreach. I don't even think it's for the production of the podcast. I think that's all going fine. Well, maybe it's not a producer. What would you call it? Because a producer I mean, is going to, the help person if, that you attract It would help if they greased up the machine that is the podcast. You know, Yeah, but that's not going to make the biggest difference. And so if you put out a video producer, 99.9% nine percent of those people can't do that thing so would it be like an agent or something i would have to google it for sure yeah to me like it sounds like you have like you build up some sort of network of a couple people that just kind of have contacts and um once one of them finds somebody that would be suitable for us then they get paid you know like the fee yeah it's, and it's beneficial for them and for us is this just a commission thing that yeah. so we just put feelers out and we say maybe with five people, we'll pay you based on the guests you bring in. You could do five people, yeah. or if you pay one person, ideally that person has a network of people who do what they do, and then they'll just pay those people if they really need something, yeah. and then they cover it with their commission. Is it worth it to hire somebody who maybe is just resourceful? Like one person who does everything, but maybe they could you know, find people and network? I will say this, which yeah. is I um, work with a company that does something similar, and the guy is very resourceful, but it takes time to build a network. And so what you don't have is that you have the time that he's undergoing to build that network that you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. But if you can find somebody who's already built that network, then you don't have to pay for that time. You just pay for their experience. Yeah. And I mean, I think I, I don't like waiting. So I'm like, I would rather find somebody who has already done it and already has a network because building one takes time. That's just me, though. I like that. What do yeah. you think on that? Great idea. Love it. Because I think we are under the mindset that, that we have to hire someone full time for three months. No. Okay. You can hire. I mean, you can literally do whatever you want. You just have to be clear and set the expectations to that person. So, like, 
I would just be clear when I'm putting a rec out there, I'd be like, I'm hiring someone to get this product. You have three months. And if you're able to hit this goal, which is maybe like two A-list guests or something like that, would you want to bring them on full-time? Like what would they have to do in those first three months for you to say, now I would want to bring you on full-time? And then you tell them that's what it is and it's very clear. And if they agree to it and you agree to it, then like, it's great. Works on both sides. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Okay. I think it's good. I like that. Cool. Yeah. You got to get this out by tomorrow. So I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Keep going. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. This has actually been really helpful for us too. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate you guys having me. Cool. Well, thank you. I'll link to all of your info down below in the description uh, where you can also get a free stock. And you can follow me on Instagram. Worth JLS, all the way up why you can check out $2,000 and you set up for there. public. Check out Alex. Just use the code Graham. <laughs> thank you, our sponsors. For, did you just say and, for some reason? <laughs> for some reason. And with that said, you guys. Till next, next time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.